Hi, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Christine Theodoropoulos. I use the pronoun she, and I am the Dean of the College of Architecture and Environmental Design. And we are all so happy to welcome all of you. We know that many of you are students of our city and regional planning program. Many of you are alumni of our city and regional planning program. And then we have the practicing planners and leaders of our planning community joining us today. Uh, I wanted to share just one observation with you. Uh, as many of you know, Cal Poly is going through one of the most remarkable investigations of its curriculum that we've had in history, where we are looking at every course and every program as we transition from a quarter to a semester calendar. And in the process, our faculty are thinking about how you structure curriculum. Do you structure it around skills? Do you structure it around subject areas? And what is coming from the city and regional planning department, the faculty, the students, is the idea that maybe you structure it around the issues. Maybe you really look at what the needs of the future of planning are, and that is how you start to configure a learning experience for future planners. So this is so timely because basically we're inviting people to talk to us about the future of planning in a way that will inform that work. I have the great honor of introducing our first two speakers and I would like to invite um, Phil and Jimmy up to the, the table here so you can see them. So the person on your right, uh, Phil Serena was elected to the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors in 2010 and re-elected to a fourth term in 2022. A native Sacramentan, he attended California State University, Sacramento, before coming to Cal Poly to receive his master's degree in city and regional planning. In addition to his service on the Board of Supervisors, Phil participates on numerous local boards and commissions, including the first five Sacramento Commission, Sacramento Regional Transit District, Sacramento Area Flood Control District, and the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District, just to name a few. I, I would be remiss if I didn't include that he serves on the advisory council for the College of Architecture and Environmental Design and is an honored alumnus of our college. Uh, continuing a little bit, he's also served, has served at the state level um, uh, with California Governor Edmund Brown, who appointed him as the first Sacramento area representative to the California Air Resources Board. Uh, service that he just recently concluded. Jimmy Paulding, the person to your left, is the San Luis Obispo County Supervisor representing the 4th District. Jimmy was elected to the Board of Supervisors in June of 2022 and previously served as an Arroyo Grande City Council member from 2018 to 2022. A native of Arroyo Grande, Jimmy graduated from Cal Poly in 2008 with a degree in, tell me, city and regional planning. His early career centered on planning, designing and building roads, wastewater plants and criminal justice facilities. After pursuing a law degree from the Santa Barbara and Ventura Colleges of Law and becoming an attorney, Jimmy started a law practice in 2017 and has practiced law in the areas of business and real estate planning ever since. Our two amazing speakers have planned a conversation that they're going to have with one another for your benefit. So welcome. Testing one, two. One, two. You, you want to start? Put your hand back to so uh, thank you, Dean, for uh, that introdu uh, introduction. Um, this is uh, really already very rewarding to see so many people here. And uh, uh, both uh, Supervisor Paulding and myself had a, a 
good chance to not just uh, catch up over lunch, but talk to several of you, some of whom have come as far away as uh, Trinity uh, County. So this is uh, an exceptional uh, showing already. Uh, we look forward to the afternoon. Uh, some of the things that uh, Christine uh, left out of the bio is that uh, I was fortunate enough not to just get a, a MCRP degree from this fine uh, university, but I also met my wife, uh, Roxana, who is here as well. She uh, took her degree in architecture the same year in 1994, and we've been happily married for 27 years. So I really appreciate her being here. And then the other, the other thing that was left out of, the, out of both bios is that both Jimmy and I, uh, to maintain our uh, mental stability, enjoy playing music in our respective bands. So uh, that, that's uh, something that shouldn't be overlooked. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and get us started. I think what we have planned for our portion of this afternoon is to um, have a conversation as uh, the Dean expressed, but uh, perhaps even more importantly, we'd actually like to have a conversation with you. We'd love to, to engage uh, in the Q&A portion of this as uh, kind of the, the main uh, component part of our contribution uh, today. But it is, I think, pretty unique to uh, have uh, two um, individuals from the same university, same rel relatively the same program, uh, now serving in very similar capacities as county supervisors be before you. It feels almost like uh, this is the before and after uh, in, in some respects. Um, so you have that to look forward to, uh, Jimmy. Uh, but, I, but I think it is going to be uh, a unique perspective that you hear from both of us not just in terms of our uh, tenure and uh, the differences in our community, but the, the common responsibilities that we share as supervisors. But uh, as you noted uh, from the program, what we really wanted to do was to share with you how we see the future of planning uh, evolving as it relates to kind of our principal charge as elected members of a board of supervisors, which really fundamentally is about solving problems and being responsive to constituents and, and their needs. Um, that's not something that is purely relegated to people in elective office, to be sure. That is something that requires a lot of teamwork. It requires a lot of uh, confidence uh, in department heads. Um, but uh, I think the discipline of planning, certainly from, from my perspective, has changed greatly in the last uh, decade, just as I believe our uh, jobs uh, as elected uh, people has also changed based on the challenges that we're facing. And we're gonna uh, talk about some of those challenges when we get into the, the substance of our uh, conversation here. So with that, I'm gonna hand the microphone to my friend and, and colleague here, uh, Supervisor Paulding. Thank you, Phil. It is such a pleasure to be here with, with all of you today. It looks like we have a really healthy mix of students and faculty, but I wanna just get a little idea here. So how many students do we have in the room? Okay, oh, I love that. And faculty. Okay, and then alumni. All right, give it up for the Cal Poly CRP alumni. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, one of the distinctions too, I think that we have the opportunity to explore today is uh, being a supervisor with San Luis Obispo County. We're a, a small county. For example, our population is 280,000 people. And uh, Phil, what is the uh, Sacramento population and then your district? So the, the population of Sacramento County is uh, approaching 1.6 million, and uh, each of the five supervisors represents about 380,000 people. So 280,000 people here in Slow County, my district is 62,000 people. So uh, you'll get an opportunity here to, to hear um, not only the, uh, the distinctions between the types of challenges that we are dealing with in a more rural coastal county, um, but uh, also, you know, big city uh, challenges and, uh, and the future that we see uh, in terms of the role of planning there too. Um, just a little bit more about, about my background. Um, in addition to being a, a Cal Poly CRP grad, I did grow up in the community, uh, grew up in Arroyo Grande and uh, have had the opportunity to live here and also met my wife here at Cal Poly. 
Uh, she wasn't able to make it today, but uh, we met in the College of Architecture and Environmental Design. She was studying architecture engineer, architectural engineering at the time. Um, so proud to be here in the capacity as a, as a native uh, San, Lu San Luis Obispo County one. I don't know if that's the way you say that, but, um, and obviously as a, a CRP grad. So with that, uh, you know, you give a politician a microphone, we'll go forever. So let's get into the discussion. Is your mic working? Check. Okay, Check. let's do this. Very good. All right. So um, I should have uh, uh, spoken to you a little bit about uh, Sacramento County as well. Um, it is a, an urban county. It's somewhat unique uh, out of the 58 here in the state of California in that we actually have a very substantial uh, population in the unincorporated county. In fact, we uh, joke once in a while that we're the largest city in the county. We have about 650,000 people that live in the unincorporated county. Uh, the city of Sacramento is about 100,000 fewer people. Um, and that's unique because that means that the county actually has to provide all the municipal services along with all the countywide services that you've come to expect from, uh, from county governance. Um, so that means that uh, we administer some of the, of course, some of the most intimate levels of service, whether it be uh, child protective services and public health. And I'm sure this whole room, I would hope, has a new appreciation for uh, the public health role that counties uh, play following the pandemic. Uh, but in Sacramento County, in addition to all those countywide services, we also have, for instance, Department of Transportation, certainly our planning department, building departments, um, uh, animal care and control. And so that makes us a little, a little uh, unique uh, compared to the other uh, 48 or other 57 uh, counties in, in the state. So when we were um, preparing for this conversation today, uh, we really wanted to kind of um, uh, circumnavigate what are those challenges that uh, we face, whether you are serving uh, to represent a constituency in a rural county versus an urban county. And that's where we find a lot of similarities. Um, and so uh, hopefully uh, you're taking notes and we'll have some good questions when it comes to some of the subject matter. But I would say far and away, uh, at least in my experience right now, I'd say up, upwards of about 80% of my time and energy and that of my staff and our executive staff in Sacramento County are grappling with the challenge of homelessness. Um, it's something that I think in years past, you may might you know say that depending on your windshield survey of the world is something that is really uh, an issue in uh, urban downtowns. Well, we, cert we know that that certainly is not the case any longer, unfortunately. It is a challenge in our urban cores. It's a challenge in our suburban areas, all our commercial corridors, and even in our uh, rural um, parts of our, our state and our counties. And so uh, it is something that uh, continues to um, drive uh, what we do day in and day out. It continues to have a great uh, amount of influence on how we budget every year. And we're required by state law to have a balanced budget by uh, the end of June. Um, and so uh, we're getting ready, in fact, uh, in both counties to, to have those discussions in earnest uh, here shortly. Uh, but I would say if I had to, to, to identify one area of the job of being a county supervisor that has changed the most, it's, it's on that particular issue. And it's very, very uh, difficult to address because it comes down fundamentally uh, to uh, human nature and uh, human will. Because you can uh, certainly uh, convince yourself that you come up with the next best mousetrap, so to speak, in terms of providing more housing or tiny homes or uh, looking at better service delivery. But ultimately, uh, in, it's until you have someone that is in the circumstance of homelessness uh, regardless of how they got there, to say yes to those services, say yes to the offer of shelter. Um, and that part can be uh, very, very frustrating. As far as the future of planning and how I believe it can play an important part, um, I think it means that planners uh, can no longer just think about the housing um, part of that. They're going to have to be, uh, I think, very willing and deliberate in their efforts to join along with social service uh, deliver. Uh, delivery methods and models, both in our local governments and our nonprofit worlds, uh, to make sure that when we are looking at um, different types of housing opportunities to provide the shelter, that it is um, designed 
located, permitted uh, in a way that uh, takes into account um, what services are needed to best help that individual or that family, whether it's a substance use disorder or uh, mental health um, services. Uh, that's something that is not just any longer relegated just to uh, social service uh, providers. So, um, Jimmy, I don't know uh, what your experience is, but um, certainly love to hear what you know what you're doing here in, in San Luis Obispo County and what you think the future is like uh, in a more rural um, context. Yeah. So, I think I also want to add to um, what you were saying there, Phil, about uh, you know the kind of the the new challenge, the scope of the challenge that we're facing as local jurisdictions and homelessness is, it's getting worse. Um, when we look at uh, California, you know, this urgent humanitarian crisis is really what, what it is, um, is estimated to be 172,000 unhoused individuals. Right here in Slow County, we're dealing with 1,500 uh, individuals. And um, I know oftentimes what people see are the encampments and, and folks that are struggling on the streets, but one of the issues we're dealing with is uh, all of the funding that we're putting toward our local nonprofits to actually keep people housed. So housing prevention and, and that need is continuing to grow. Um, I want to circle back on, you know, what the role of the planner is in this particular, uh, dealing with this particular challenge, because it may not be readily apparent. It may not be a part of uh, your curriculum as students, but um, one of the advantages of the city regional planning major or the M uh, uh, CRP is that so many of us don't actually just go into the workforce and simply do planning. You may end up doing social work. Um, for example, in our um, new homeless services division, which we've formed within the county to tackle this problem head on, we have a, a, a diverse uh, you know, group of people uh, from multiple disciplines. And so uh, for those of you that uh, do have a passion for tackling the most uh, pressing social issues of our time, I would simply encourage you to um, not lose faith. Faith, for example, if, if your uh, perception of this particular career path is that you'll be doing simply land use planning or something like that. There's so many different directions that you can go. Um, one of the other things that uh, really implicates regional planning in the context of how we uh, approach homelessness is regional collaboration. And that's strengthening the role of, for example, here on the Central Coast, we've got seven cities and the county, and uh, they can at times be territorial or parochial. And so we need to leverage the um, existing capacity of organizations like the San Luis Obispo Council of Governments, uh, a board that I have the pleasure of serving on, to focus on regional plans. And to that end, we are working on a housing and infrastructure plan um, that does look at housing from a macro level. And obviously, that's a separate topic we might get into, um, but it certainly has a, a, a nexus to homelessness. And so, uh, yeah, I'll stop there for now. So I'm glad that uh, Supervisor Paulding mentioned um, um, the Council of Governments here in San Luis Obispo. Uh, and our uh, experience is we had a chance to compare notes before uh, coming up here. Uh, one of the most surprising things when you get elected to uh, supervisor here, and I would say in California, because I think it's common to every county, is that uh, you're not just elected to serve on the County Board of Supervisors, you've been elected to serve on upwards of 30 other boards and commissions. And uh, for instance, in Sacramento County, I also have been serving on the Regional Transit District Board of Directors for several years, where we have, have a number of transportation planners uh, that work in that agency. And uh, certainly uh, our public transit agency, and I'm sure other public transit agencies across the state uh, have to be a willing partner. And in our case, I'm really satisfied that uh, they have been a, a really willing partner to work with counties and cities uh, to not just focus on the sheltering uh, needs of our unhoused population, but also our transportation needs. So I say this because I think there's going to be tremendous opportunities in various contexts, perhaps some that that you haven't really uh, thought about for planners in the future to uh, to focus not just on how to get people from point A to point B in an efficient, timely manner and to do it with minimal impacts to our environment, but uh, also in a way that uh, really uh, is expressive of the social equity uh, needs of uh, the traveling public as well. So uh, homelessness, again, uh, is one of the areas I think we both agree that uh, the future of planning uh, is necessarily going to have to, um, uh, you know, uh, 
really have your expertise as as planners um, involved because it is not again just something that is the responsibility of social workers any longer. So the the next um, challenge that uh, we've agreed to, to talk a little bit about, and this is maybe where we have some some pretty distinct differences based on a rural and an urban county, is uh, post pandemic what I call urban repurposing. Uh, I can tell you in uh, the county and uh, in city of Sacramento, of course, we're a capital city here, uh, here in the state of California, we have a number of uh, state government agencies that occupy a considerable amount of office uh, space in our uh, central business district in the city. Uh, but we also have other suburban um, uh, state uh, agency campuses. Uh, and what we've learned, uh, I think everyone has learned uh, from the pandemic is that in many instances, uh, working from home is not just uh, necessary when you're trying to um, deal with uh, a contagious uh, pandemic the way we did, uh, but in many respects, it's actually proven to, to be more efficient. And so in, in large part, uh, there's agreement in Sacramento uh, by our city uh, partners, city councils, and our commercial brokerage community that uh, what we, grew accustomed to in the past in terms of vacancies, uh, office space vacancies, it's gonna be a new day. Uh, and, and the planning professionals that are in this room or that will be coming out of this university are gonna be thrust right in the middle of that, I believe, in some of the, the more um, high density urban cores uh, in our state. And that's gonna really, really uh, rely on kind of the fulcrum of your expertise in terms of how to repurpose those you know millions and millions of, of square feet um we you know unfortunately here in the state of california we no longer have redevelopment uh which i think is a shame that's a different topic for a different day uh but i think uh, one of the post-pandemic things that I, I believe is most glaring that really will have an impact on the future of uh, planning the planning profession and what you will be uh doing or expected to do is help us uh, think about uh, appropriate conversion to different uses in those spaces, um, have us uh, reconsider what it means to have certain types of parking ratios based on different needs. Um, in, in fact, I think in many respects, it can be considered somewhat of a blank uh, canvas uh, for you to do great work. So I'll uh, let uh, Supervisor Pauline maybe uh, give his impression of what that may or may not look like um, here in Tillamook, Bispo County. You know, here in Slow County, we don't have the, you know, the big strip malls and things like that. So uh, how we repurpose commercial space to, for example, create more affordable housing opportunities, it's a little bit of a different task. Um, but during the pandemic, I worked with a number of local elected officials to form a, a the Central Coast Economic Recovery Initiative. And one of the um, things we were trying to address there was how do we look at, you know, uh, a number of these trends, you know, we see the telework trend that was only um, you know, further uh, fostered through the, the pandemic. And we also see uh, the proliferation of online uh, purchasing. And so how many people here love to go to the mall to buy all your goods and <laughs> nobody, okay. <laughs> so it's just, we're in a completely different environment. And um, to some extent, uh, the city of San Luis Obispo is looking at this uh, for the downtown area. And we do have a pretty high vacancy rate. And so we have to be creative. One of the challenges this action team that we um, uh, put together dealt with is that it's hard to go in and take a commercial space and convert it to you know, living space. When you look at the proximity of windows and the um, you know, bathroom facilities and all of the you know, infrastructure needs are just so different that it's it's a challenge, but that's where it's going to take creativity. And, um, you know, I'm a big proponent of infill development. So we need to be looking at how to maximize and fully utilize uh, existing developed space. Um, another big one, and this starts to head us in the direction of talking about housing, which I think is on our list, um, is ADUs, accessory dwelling units or granny homes. And um, I, I, I think that that's an important way to uh, increase the amount of infill housing, affordable housing that we have. And here at the um, county level, we just launched a new program of um, that essentially is a pre-designed set of plans that any uh, citizen can take over the counter and say, all right, we'd like to build this unit. We've got them in uh, four or five different square footages. 
And obviously that saves the cost of having to pay an architect to design uh, that home. Now, not to take away from some of the uh, job opportunities that you may have in this profession, um, but uh, we've got to get creative at how we're looking at ensuring that we're uh, moving the needle on affordable housing. So uh, but maybe we want to transition to that topic and I'll hand sure. it back over to Phil. Thank you. So um, as it relates to, to housing, um, again, you're hearing from someone that uh, before he was in elective office was a, had a project management consulting business, uh, worked with the local home building community uh, quite closely in Sacramento for a number of years. And in fact, uh, one of the reasons I uh, chose to, um, to come to Cal Poly and seek a, a master's degree in city and regional planning was having worked for uh, a home builder for several years while I was going uh, through my undergraduate experience in Sacramento. So I have a, a great deal of respect for the industry. Uh, doesn't mean I'm, uh, you know, a, a fan of urban sprawl. It just means that I think that the provision of housing in the state uh, is, uh, can be looked at commensurate with the provision of uh, food and the provision of other uh, necessary um, expectations that we all have to live a, a happy, healthy life. Unfortunately, I think we're all acutely aware that the state has been behind the eight ball for several years now in terms of housing production. It's woefully low. Um, we were talking earlier about our regional housing needs assessments and, and how they, they compare. And I've yet to find another county that says, oh, we're not only you know, meeting expectations, we're beating it. I can tell you in Sacramento County that it's not, uh, not the case. We've been uh, short several thousand units for uh, several uh, years now, um, whether it be infill or greenfield development. Um, but what I would stress is that I think the future of uh, the planning profession as it affects the ability to do better at providing necessary housing should not just be looked at in terms of how do you plan for it physically, where uh, do you plan for it in relationship to other uses, but I think it will have to also uh, uh, incorporate how do we do a better job uh, in kind of in the temporal uh, realm of housing production. That is, how can we improve the permitting uh, of housing so that um, we don't have the kind of delays that unfortunately we see in many jurisdictions when it comes to uh, the provision of housing. Um, I think the, the supervisor just, just mentioned some innovative ways they're, they're looking at that here in San Luis, San Luis Obispo County. Uh, but I can tell you that having been on that other side of the counter, so to speak, to get permitted, uh, to get uh, building permits, uh, to build housing, it still takes way too long, especially in a, in a crisis, um, the likes of which, you know, it will only get worse if we don't find a better way to not just locate housing, uh, but to have it uh, approved um, uh, in a more timely fashion so that we can respond a lot better to uh, the needs of uh, tomorrow's renters and homeowners. And to piggyback on that, I see you know, the role of the planner um, in the future as it relates to tackling this problem that is more urgent than it ever has been in our state is not only to you know, do whatever you can to influence legislation. Um, for example, CEQA reform uh, is a hot button issue. Um, I would like to do a show of hands on who thinks we need it or not, but I won't ask. I wanna, you know, <laughs> okay, we got one right here from our director of the YIMBY. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes, in my backyard. Um, but uh, on the other hand, at the just the local level, going back to what Phil said about you know planning and permitting, or the, the the planning and building, the role of the planner, for example, in Slow County, in our planning and building department, we know we have this massive backlog. We have not found a way to streamline uh, the smallest units down to the ADU program that we're working on, or the larger uh, development projects, and we've we've got to do that. But from a a statistical standpoint, I thought I'd share a few stats. 64% uh, of Californians struggle with housing affordability. Um, from a statewide standpoint, when we look at our regional housing needs allocation uh, numbers through HCD, we have permitted less than 1% of very low income units, less than 2.5% of low income, and less than 2.3% of moderate income uh, as mandated by HCD in our current RENA cycle. Um, and we're 18% of the way through our cycle. So should we, we should be at least at that 18%. So we're just way behind 
Um, and I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit about the challenge of NIMBYism. Um, you know, as an elected official, uh, it is uh, difficult when you see a, a project that makes perfect sense. We know that the uh, project has been designed in a way that, uh, like infill, for example, that uh, does all the things that we learn about in CRP. We know that it's an example of smart growth, that it's transit oriented, that uh, it is mixed use, for example, or that it fits with the community and that still you have this opposition from the public because it's simply something they don't want next door. So that is that is a challenge that you will all have to wrestle with. And, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, ideas for how you do that as a planner, I think you just have to have some thick skin and be prepared to go out into the world and deal with communities that aren't going to be happy about things that we need to do. And as elected officials, you know, we have to find uh, the courage uh, in some cases to, to make really difficult decisions. Um, I had a few uh, notes about, you know, policies that I think need to be implemented, but um, we might, I'm sure we'll get some questions on housing. So I'll reserve uh, that uh, discussion for that point. In time. Great, thank you. So uh, I think in the interest of time, because we do want to, um, uh, you know, have some questions and hopefully provide some, some good answers uh, to those questions. I think we'll uh, just take one more area where I think we both agree. Um, the planning profession is going to uh, perhaps have its uh, greatest influence or should, and that is with regards to climate change. And of course, I think we all understand what that is by now because we live it. Um, it's no longer something that we see in a very distant future, decades away. It's happening to us now. The fires um, are happening now. Um, the atmospheric rivers uh, that uh, come and go, uh, the unpredictability uh, of our weather uh, in general is something that uh, we're grappling with today. Uh, but in terms of um, the role, specific role of planners, I think adaptation is probably uh, one of the key areas where I think the expectation is going to be present that uh, planners, both uh, public sector and private sector and the consulting uh, um, spheres are going to really be expected to uh, help us um, with uh, how do we best respond to the fact that our rivers uh, is, you know, Sacramento, we have two major rivers, the Sacramento and the American. Uh, how do we plan for uh, flood protection differently? Um, and so that's not just something that's going to be relevant to cities and counties with rivers, uh, but this entire state, um, in fact, our entire globe, uh, is really going to have to uh, wrestle with how do we adapt to our changing weather patterns and the impacts that come with that uh, very swiftly. And so in terms of the curricula that uh, you have now and that we might have later uh, here at uh, Cal Poly, I would hope that there is going to be an emphasis, if there isn't one already, in really understanding uh, how to come up with uh, not just our climate action plans, which some counties are in the midst of, some counties have actually approved, uh, some counties have yet to uh, adopt, um, are dealing with, which is kind of the comprehensive way we look at, at climate change and how best to reduce the impacts of climate change on a countywide basis, but really more specifically is how do we adapt to that and think differently about the risks that come with uh, climate change. So San Luis Obispo County doesn't have a climate action plan. We should all be asking ourselves why. Um, it's certainly something that uh, I would uh, equate to the past politics of our board of supervisors, but I'm not going to get into that today. Um, it's, you know, I remember when I was studying CRP uh, back in 2005, 2006, that was one of the, the new uh, paradigm shifts. Like we all need to have climate action plans. So. Um, you know, it's unfortunate when, as elected officials, we find ourselves in situations where the, the work just hasn't been done and there's so much catch up to do. Um, but from a climate change standpoint, I'll just share some specific examples, um, eye-opening examples for me of how um, this particular community has been impacted. Um, for example, with these uh, cyclone bomb atmospheric river storms that we saw in January, February and March, um, the community of Oceano in South County has been dealing with uh, not only flooding for some of the on some of the agriculture uh, uh, properties, uh, but and farms. But we had to 
uh, issue evacuation orders due to our levee situation along the Arroyo Grande Creek. And the fact that that levee is only designed for a 10 year uh, storm event, not the 50 year or 100 year, which we saw, um, of which we know are going to become more prevalent. And so the assumptions that have been guiding the, you know, the way that we design and engineer our infrastructure need to change and they need to catch up with the reality of the situation on the ground. We almost had to evacuate 1300 residents in Oceano and had that levy failed, which there was a great potential uh, for it to do, we would have been dealing with a situation much like what happened in uh, Pajaro in uh, Monterey County where the flooding did occur. Um, so we've, we've got to get with the program. We need to uh, prioritize uh, disaster preparedness as much as we need to ensure that we're designing our communities for uh, to make them more resilient. And um, because, you know, wildfire, drought, flooding, seawater level rise here on the coast, these issues are not going away. Um, so with that, I thought I'd just ask a few questions about, um, you know, the role of the planner in tackling um, some of these critical challenges as a way to lead into the Q&A. Does that sound good? Okay, so how do we ensure we have safe communities? How do we design sustainable communities? How do we protect our environment and natural resources while at the same time ensuring we have a healthy balance of jobs and housing? How do we address gentrification and ensure equitable development? How do we strengthen our communities to be more resilient? And in the case of Slow County, how do we ensure that we have enough affordable workforce housing so our workers can afford to live and work in our community. I don't wanna see our community become just one big retirement community, for example. Um, and then how do we ensure technology plays a role in improving our lives? And maybe we'll see questions about uh, self-driving cars or smart cities and all that stuff. But uh, I thought we'd just turn it over to you for Q&A and uh, who has the first question? Yep. And I think a microphone is being delivered to you. Thank you. I believe we spoke a little earlier. Um, Mitchell of Trinity County over or Trinity County Planning over here. And a question I have is about the growing division we have seen. Over these past few years, we have seen a growing skepticism of public institutions, yielded or unyielded. It has been something that has led to lots of disagreement and polarization on approaches. And with this kind of skepticism. I have noticed that in some instances it has come to planning. I have seen stories about people theorizing that there is a conspiracy behind the 15 minute city. A question that I have regarding that is how do we reinforce these institutions against the possibility of um, this kind of mistrust and uh, just assuming of bad intentions? In other words, how do we reinforce our community roots and just ensure that the community is with us and trusts that we have, I know the right way. Thank you, it's a great question. Um, and as I was uh, expressing to someone earlier, you know, I had the, the great um, challenge to be uh, chair of the Board of Supervisors in 2020 and help announce that the county was closing down uh, due to the pandemic. And subsequently we had our doors to the chamber of our, uh, where we do the public's business knocked down by vaccine deniers, um, and we had to evacuate uh, with police protection. Um, that's just one example of, uh, this is me editorializing a bit, but just one example of some of the skepticism about things uh, that we have to deal with. But I think generally, when you're talking about uh, conspiracy theories or skepticism or distrust in uh, government institutions, which unfortunately we have uh, seen um, kind of elevate in recent years. Um, that is uh, something that I, I think you need to internalize as, uh, as planners, future planners, because you will be the experts that we politicians rely on more, even more so than we do now. Uh, when it comes to really separating the politics from the facts, separating the politics um, and, and really uh, relying heavily on the expertise, not just planners, but I think other professionals uh, in the county government, city, municipal government uh, will um, really uh, need the, um, the expression of that expertise so much more. 
uh, to help us not just do the right thing, not just plan better communities, uh, but help us communicate back to our constituents uh, what the facts really are and to help dispel the fact that, you know, not everything, believe it or not, is politically motivated when it comes to how we represent you. So uh, again, that's why I think it's a, it's a really timely, good question, uh, because I don't think it's just reserved for uh, the realm of planning. I think it really uh, speaks to how we see the future of, of local government. I think that was a great response. I think the only thing I would add is that the role of I mean, we, the, the public relations or public information officer, there are specific jobs, that, job titles, roles that people exercise in government or in, in the private sector uh, to get you know, good information out to whatever group is, whatever the target audience is. Uh, but I, I think at this point in time, we all have a, a duty and an obligation to ensure that we're getting good factual information out there. And as a as an elected official, I do find it a, a challenge when um, I try not to go on next door, but occasionally <laughs> I'll get a screenshot of a next door comment where someone uh, indicated that some uh, project is moving so forward or we implemented or enacted some policy and, and it's just not even true. Um, and so now the way I see it is I've got to be getting factual information out there constantly, just knowing that the misinformation machine is, is, is going and, and you've got to do that as a planner too, at the, uh, at the community level, at the project level, you've got to get it. If you, if you know that you're going to be working on a project that will be contentious or controversial, you've got to get out into the community, have community meetings, engage the community with the facts, and you have to do it early and often. <laughs> if you uh, want to ensure that that project moves forward. So I would just, yeah, just say that everybody's got, you know, uh, that on their plate now to, to get good information out. Yeah, I, I can agree more. And, and uh, the communication um, part of what we do is simply not just, you know, one supervisor trying to communicate with his or her constituency uh, when it comes to a controversial subject. It really, subjects, it really takes um, a team to do that. And I just have to share real briefly a funny story. My late, my late father served as uh, the city of Sacramento's mayor for seven years before he passed uh, in 1999. And he uh, told, told me this uh, story that one time about a community that wanted a stop sign. And they were convinced that there had been too many accidents. And so he brought a, an engineer, not a planner, but an engineer to a community meeting. And someone asked the question, how many people have to die before we get our stop sign? And the engineer said, well, 1.3. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, that's, it's a great example of, of, you know, be cognizant, be aware of who your audience is and understand that uh, uh, human nature is what it is and that uh, we can't just think in, in the figures and numbers. Uh, we have to have um, the expertise certainly applied, but it can be applied, uh, I think, very strategically sometimes and, and uh, deliberate without uh, being confront confrontational and uh, that's where I think uh, you can really help us as great communicators as well. I think we have time for one more. No. Well, after all of that about us, us wanting the Q and A, but we're going to take one more right here, right here in front. Sorry, I'm here. So the, the question is, in our respective um, uh, experiences, have we uh, been involved with providing housing or sheltering for homeless? I can say in, in Sacramento County, we certainly have, and we continue to do more of it. Our, the model that we employ uh, is called a safe stay uh, model, and it's um, small units that are heated and air conditioned. Um, they're about, uh, I don't know, I think they're about a... a I want to say about 200 square feet, maybe something less than that. Uh, we have a place for pets. That is so critical. I can't emphasize it enough. If you don't have a place for pets, for folks that are suffering chronic homelessness, you're often going to be met with a no when it comes to offering help. Uh, we have substance use disorder counseling on site. Uh, we have availability of medically assisted treatment for substance use disorder on site. We have mental health professionals on site. Uh, we have folks from... Um, uh, our DA's office that are there to help with outstanding warrants, 
Um, so again, it goes back to, it's, it can't just be about those 200 square foot units. It has to be about the services that come with that. But um, yes, yeah, so we are doing that. There are usually about 100 to 150 units at a time on these various campuses. We're trying to have them scatter site around the county so that it's um, as equitable as possible so that there's no claims that, oh, well, it's just you know gravitating to uh, low income areas or areas that don't uh, voice their uh, opposition as much as the next uh, neighborhood over. Uh, but yes, we do have a very um, kind of uh, well thought out uh, uh, plan in place for how we're trying to provide both the sheltering and the services in Sacramento County. And for Slow County, we have a presentation from our Homeless Services Division on Tuesday at our Board of Supervisors meeting about what we're doing to meet our goal of reducing homelessness by 50% over the next five years. So you should attend it. You could even uh, watch it from home. Um, and with that, I'll just, uh, I guess, conclude in, in thanking all of you for uh, attending today and allowing uh, us to have the pleasure of uh, getting to share on these topics. What a pleasure it is indeed. And look, look forward to the panelists here in a second. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Phil Serna. Thank you, Supervisor uh, Jimmy Paulding. I wish we had another hour for Q&A, but we have to move on, apologize. <laughs> I'm Amir Hydra Suleha, City and Regional Planning Department Head. It's a pleasure to see you all, students, faculty, former students, practitioners. Um, and it's also, I want to take a chance to thank you, our SERPAC, uh, advisory board of the department who really helped us to put together uh, this meeting and all our sponsors. Uh, you see all the uh, logos uh, over there, all the companies. So special thank to them for making this happen. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Um, we have great speakers and you're gonna enjoy the discussion that um, you're gonna see talking about the future of planning and their current um, reading of the situation in planning in California. Uh, I would like to introduce Leora Tan Watko at Ross. She's National Organizing Director of EMB Action. Please take a seat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She's formally educated in architecture, but has been organizing for housing since 2014 when she realized that architecture is political. Before Yimbi Action, she worked at Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo, where she focused on organizing people in support of affordable housing. Leora has also served as the president of Peninsula Democratic Coalition, the oldest and largest Democratic Club in Silicon Valley. When she's near surface level parking lots, she's point out that they could be homes to anyone within hearing distance. And let me introduce you to the next panelist. Saharnaz Mirzazad is Chief Deputy Director of Climate Policy and Planning with California Governor's Office of Planning and Research. When she oversees the state climate and planning policy development, along with implementing multiple programs to pilot new initiatives. Previously, she was the Deputy Director of Community Investment and Planning at California Strategic Growth Council, overseeing more than $3 billion of investment in infrastructure programs and community-driven policy situations, solutions. She worked with local and regional governments to pilot new initiative for bridge climate and equity goals, including transformative climate community program. She, all, she has over 15 years of experience working in public private sectors on infrastructure development, climate resiliency and community development. And I have to say that Sahanaz and I go back 20 years ago when we were both architecture students in Iran and just we're meeting again on the other side of the globe. <laughs> uh, I think we were one year apart. Stephen Lewis is uh, an architect and a tireless advocate for social justice and diversity within the field of architecture. He's currently a principal with the firm ZGF Architects, 
where he leads the Los Angeles office urban design practice. Prior to joining ZGF, Stephen held the position of urban design director for the Detroit Central Region, where he played a key role in shaping the vision of present and future development. Stephen is the AI 2016 Whitney M. Young Junior Award recipient and was elevated to the AIA College of Fellows in December of 2015. He was a founding partner of Los Angeles-based firm of Raw International in 1984, and for the next 20 years was an essential part of the firm's growth and success. In, two, in December of 2010, he concluded a two-year term as president of the National Organization of Minority Architects, traveling around the country advocating for architects of color while cultivating the next generation of diverse architects and designer. Thank you, Stephen, to be here. And unfortunately, our fourth panelist just informed me last night that due to some family emergency, he cannot attend, attend Billy Reeves. Um, uh, but we have John Donahoe to help us as a moderator. Uh, Billy Riggs was also um, supposed to be the moderator of the panel, but John accepted to be the moderator of the session. John has served as Director of Planning and Entitlement for Stanford University Office of Real, Real Estate since 2008. John's primary responsibility has been to oversee the entitlement process for Stanford's development of residential and commercial projects located in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties. John has over 35 years of professional planning experience in both the public and private sectors throughout Northern California. John has authored several significant specific plans, including the Evergreen Specific Plan in San Jose and the Glen Loma Ranch Specific Plan in Gilroy, California. John has also served on a variety of committees related to affordable housing issues. John is also a CRP alumni serving on the advisory board of the department SERPAC and also an adjunct faculty in our department. So multiple connections. And that's why you agreed to serve as a moderator. Thank you so much. And I have to add to the list that I also met my wife here at Cal Poly. <laughs> this, this past January, we, we celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. So, which, which, which also indicates that I am from the class of 1984. And in 1984, we didn't, it wasn't the city and regional planning department then because we didn't have cities. So <laughs> <laughs> that was added later. Okay, so I think we'll just, for now, just go down this and then think of questions. The beauty of a seminar that's called uh, the future of planning is takes the pressure off of all of us because there are no wrong answers. So. Thank you. Um, so I work for UMB Action and UMB Law. Um, as the supervisor said, UMB stands for yes in my backyard. Um, YIMBY Action is a nonprofit organization uh, that, that organizes people to support housing projects, uh, pro-housing laws at every level, from the local to the, the state to the federal, and pro-housing candidates who are running for office. Um, we recently mobilized a bunch of volunteers to participate in their housing element process. So that's where they have um, recently had the most interfacing with planners. Um, so that's one side. I have I have two bosses. Um, there's the YIMBY Action side and the YIMBY Law side. YIMBY Law sues cities who are not complying with state law. Um, so I'm the national organizing director for both of them. Um, that means I'm basically a summer camp counselor. Um, <laughs> we meet people where they are, uh, and then we move them to participate in a coordinated political action for change. Um, so the first things first, I want to update the title of this presentation. Um, it, I would like to change it to don't listen to the Karens, uh, housing and social justice. Um, <laughs> and I am saying that because our current planning process 
prioritizes the wants of the comfortable over the needs of the marginalized and our society in general. And so, <laughs> thank you. Um, so as planners, you all need to be resilient against complaints. Complaints. You are here to implement the law. You are not here to placate carrots. Um, so for a second, I'm gonna pick apart uh, project by project decision-making because that is what the majority of work that planners do right now. Um, and we believe that project by project decision-making is incredibly destructive. Um, when we do it this way, uh, you all get, as planners, get bombarded with questions. You know, what are we going to do about the traffic? What about schools? Where's the water going to come from? Um, and you can't solve these problems at the project level. These problems require a lot of work at the, the plan level, the state level, um, you know, the federal level. I don't know if y'all know that Japan does their land use planning at the federal level. Um, and right now, planners are getting sucked into trying to placate every concern that people have about an individual project. Um, NIMBYs are basically running a denial of service attack by tripping up planners on, in a project, you know, lodging a thousand complaints, uh, you know, badgering you guys. It's intentional and destructive, and we're never going to meet the needs of our society if we let them win. Um, in this system, you're gonna get a lot of emails from people. Some of them are gonna to be totally unhinged. Some of them are gonna come from the greatest shooter the game has ever seen, um, being basketball, Steph Curry. Um, <laughs> like, and what you're gonna to need to do is tune all of that out because things are changing because of state law. Um, and so, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about state law, but I do wanna sort of bring home the point that project by project decision-making is inherently anti-democratic. People who live close to the building, they're going to um, acutely feel the negative, the potential negative consequences of that building for them. And, uh, and the people who desperately need the housing are not gonna be able to influence the process because they don't live there, because they haven't been born yet, uh, because they don't have the time to come in the middle of a day uh, to a planning commission meeting or something like that. Um, I think another thing that happens a lot too is uh, when individual projects are proposed, we are not holding them up to the general plan and saying, okay, does this comply? Planners are spending an ungodly amount of time remaking decisions. Um, and I wanna point out that that sort of system undermines the community planning process that goes into the general plan. And we've got to cut that shit out. So for the general plan meetings, you know, if you're doing it right, you're providing childcare, you're doing them on the weekends, you're meeting people out in the community, um, you're trying to make sure people with nine to five jobs or with multiple jobs can attend these meetings. But then when you're trying to enact that general plan, someone retired is coming in the middle of the day to protest it. And that is disrespectful and a waste of time to all the people who participated in the general plan process. Um, so now that I have ranted about project by project planning, what can you as future planners actually do about it? Focus on state bills to streamline permitting, follow the Housing Accountability Act, bring up your city's legal requirement to affirmatively further fair housing. Do everything you can to base decisions in objective standards. Stop asking every elected official, every commissioner, every stakeholder if they like a project and start saying, we have to approve this project under this law. Say things to your city council members that are like, our zoning isn't compliant with our general plan. That's illegal and we need to fix it. You gotta fight like hell for every single home. Um, also, I wanna say the state law is here to help you, so lean on it. Um, I practiced this presentation with my friend Veronica who works for the city of San Francisco as a planner. And she was saying that um, more and more often she comes into work and she sees a couple of her colleagues in like their fancy meeting clothes, you know, the clothes they wear to like when they're in front of the public. And one day she walked in, she was like, oh my God, do we have a, do we have a meeting today? Why are you all dressed up? 
And the lady was like, well, I have a deposition. Uh, I have to answer questions about why we made these decisions about these projects because our city got sued. And uh, because I work for UMB Law, that is gonna be something that's more common because uh, we're gonna sue more cities who aren't complying. Um, so I also wanna say, stop worrying about the backlash um, against, against you all. The problem started 40 years ago and our current planning process is driving a homelessness and displacement crisis across the state. So it's time to push harder for the housing that your city is legally required to build. Um, and if it's getting out of control, call UMB Action. We have, uh, we have lists of people in most of the cities in California who support housing and, uh, and we activate them to stand up and support a housing where they live. Um, so to kind of summarize, like planning is and should be political, um, but project by project decision-making shouldn't be political. Making a general plan is about weighing the needs of a whole community it's about making goals for the next 20 years and anticipating some of the things that we can anticipate. And in that process, we have to make decisions that have trade-offs. There are gonna be winners and losers in that process. And your role as planners is to guide a fact-based process to make long-term planning affirmatively further fair housing. That is state law. Remind people of that fact frequently. Um, so my friend Veronica, who's a planner, I, I finished this presentation and I said like, so what do you think? And she was like, oh, I understand what you're saying. You're saying that planners should actually do what we thought we were going to school for before we were students, before we got real jobs. We thought we would be solving real problems. And I wanna say, absolutely. Our wild radical vision of the future of planning is that planners actually get to work on problems that you can solve at the level at which they can be solved. We all know that an individual project isn't gonna solve all the city's problems. And as uh, the supervisors told us, there are a pile of wicked problems out there. Segregation. We are more segregated today than we were in 1970 in California. Climate change. Those are just to name two. And we need your brains and your talents working on these kinds of problems. And we're excited to see that happen. Can I get that camera? Working now? Okay, cool. So first of all, I want to say I'm so impressed by you being here. Such a nice weather. I would totally go to beach. So I don't know why you're here. <laughs> also, for the people who are sitting behind me, if I was checking my back, I'm mom of two young kids. And I always check to see if they have like last minute drop on me or something. So <laughs> that's not that I'm kind of like have some mental problem. No, that's not the case. So uh, as uh, Amir mentioned, my name is Sahar Naz Mirzazad. I'm Chief Deputy Director at Governor's Office of Planning and Research. And uh, I'm so uh, happy to be here with the two impressive panel members and appreciate you guys being here. Uh, when I saw the uh, title of the day today, I thought that what I would have loved to learn when I was in the school and things that I should have considered when I'm shaping my future in planning. And if I can have the next slide. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of things. The U.S. Intelligence Council has identified five major areas that will impact every human being on globally in the next decade. So uh, demographic change. Uh, we are having more of older people. We are aging across the board in the globe. So that's something that will impact us. Uh, we are having more women that are in the workforce. It's a different change. This, this wasn't like this uh, 100 years ago. Next slide. Uh, in the human development, um, we have people that are more educated and they are develop, demanding more from their government, which wasn't also the case a decade ago. Uh, our environmental challenges, we are seeing uh, impacts of climate change everywhere across the globe. We are also seeing 
food security issues uh, that are impacting people. And uh, California is one of the areas that is being impacted the most. As you may know, we have a lot of challenges. We are the food hub for most of America, actually. And um, strawberry issues, as you recently know, we have lost a lot of strawberry crops because of the flooding issues recently. And it's impacting the supply chain there. Economics. Um, the world is changing. We are seeing more dominant firms across the globe, like they're dominating in different areas, IT, um, communication, and all of that. And also the trade is very fragmented uh, compared to the past. And finally, technology. And I think you all know what AI is doing to us, and it will have real impact on our city planning and how the jobs are uh, being done and how the workforce is impacted by that will have less of the people in some service areas that's really challenged and a lot of people in the workforce uh, board are thinking about it. So uh, I would like to go to the next slide. So what does that mean for us? It means new changes, new challenges, and new opportunities. So uh, if you go to the next slide, that means that you need to be more flexible. We need to think about how we can change our governance structure to respond to the uh, needs of today. Uh, uh, there, many of the laws that you have on books are from the past and things that needs to be changed, needs to be changed to meet the needs of today. How can we be more thinking about our um, governance to um, provide some uh, flexibility in the structure? Uh, the other one, the next slide, we need to be more strategic and more opportunistic. And uh, I would like to provide an example here. And that's uh, if you want to uh, think about what's happening in the market, there are people in the market that when things happen, they're trying to look for opportunities to take advantage of that. We should, be, we should have that mindset for the government too. One example of it during the COVID, uh, it was a very unfortunate situation that we had a lot of hotels and motels were actually like losing business and they were like closing off. Uh, one of the things that we were able to during that time to have a program like a room key and home key to be able to quickly purchase those uh, hotels room and turn them to housing for people that are unhoused. And that has turned to be a really good program. I wish that it would be more agile and more strategic in the approaches that we have in future to take advantage of what is in front of us for the greater good. The next slide, breaking the silos. Uh, we are great at our silos of excellence in different ways. How we can break the silos? The government has been trying to do that for a while. I'm not saying that we are successful, but uh, some of the things that's under our office, uh, California Strategic Growth Council, which is one of the offices under Office of Planning and Research, and uh, ICARP, which is uh, integrated uh, climate um, um, adaptation planning programs, uh, technical advisory committee is one of this like structures that we have figured out to be able to kind of like make people to think outside of their silos and how they can collaborate, how they can maximize the opportunities and support each other. We need more of that. We need more of that that's looking into housing issue, climate issue. One of the things that was in the last year's budget was housing as a climate strategy, which was a new way of thinking about housing issue. Housing is a climate issue. It's, they are intertwined. We can't separate them uh, from each other. The third one, engage. We need to have a meaningful engagement. Uh, one of the things that I'm so proud of um, to be involved in is transformative climate communities program. Um, I was initially, um, hired to stand up that program. And one of the things that was at the core of the program is how you can actually meaningfully engage people in the process, give them the power to make decision, not only involve them for sake of involvement. And making decision means that they have to sign off on things. They have to be part of the process from the beginning to end when they can have like a say in things that was happening in their backyard. So that's a real meaningful engagement, and especially in the low-income disadvantaged communities of California, where the people have been left out for a really long time, it's very important to be intentional. We need to be ha to have targeted outreach. Um, the population of the California that has been left out for too long, and without having them in mind, we are in real trouble. Uh, one of the things that uh, we are trying to do more and better is outreach for our uh, tribal communities. 
we haven't done really good in the past. We are trying to catch up. Uh, one of the things that we are doing under California Fifth Climate Assessment that we have a tribal advisory committee that we are bringing tribal advisors to help us shape the future of the fifth assessment. But just learning how much we are playing catch up here with these uh, tribal folks. And similarly with other minority population, uh, we are like more and more realizing that we need to be more intentional in reaching out to them. And also using the right tools. Uh, one of the things that I would suggest you to look into as a planner is participatory budgeting, uh, budgetary planning, which is basically giving people the power to decide on where their money goes versus like towards the end when they just come and talk in the council meeting or supervisors, what of supervisors. So that's the other thing that I would suggest. Next slide, please. And finally, equity should be in forefront of everything, every part of your process. If you don't have that lens, the process is set up for failure. And what we do in our office is uh, threefold technical assistance. Uh, this, again, something a new approach. In the past, we didn't have technical assistance as a part of our grant making process. It's now very common. We provide technical assistance throughout the process in the application phase, during the implementation phase, and also follow up evaluation to make sure that actually the funds, the public dollars are going where they need to go and also being impactful in a way that they were supposed to be. Capacity building. There are some communities that fundamentally lack the uh, basics to access our public dollars. Building the capacity in these communities are very integral to what we do. We have multiple programs under uh, Governor's Office of Planning and Research that intentionally tries to build that capacity. We have been very fortunate that uh, a new office has been uh, created under OPR, Office of Strategic Partnership, uh, that uh, we build the trusted messenger networks. And we, this is built on the campaign that we had through uh, census and then a vaccine campaign. And we basically funded the CBOs and nonprofit organization that has been part of that campaign to stay engaged with the state, to help us to move forward other priorities that we are caring about, like uh, our water campaign or heat campaign. Um, and this is like, capacity building approach that we are taking to make sure that the, we are connected to the communities. And finally, we have been very fortunate from um, the legislators side that they um, are letting us to have the funding set aside for many of the communities that we have across California. So um, if you're familiar with uh, the OEHA tool, the Calum Water Screen or other tools, uh, it has been very powerful to be able to set a part of the funding that you are allocating in California to low-income disadvantaged communities so we can actually make sure that they have kind of like a level playing field with other communities that have more capacity and have more resources. I think that's it. Um, I'd love to chat with you and I'll be around for Q&A. Thank you. Hey, what's good today, y'all? You all, lunch, everything. Um, before I get into my presentation, I just wanted to respond to two things. One is to my elected official colleagues. Um, we did something very interesting in Detroit, and this is about, you know, you're getting a lot of input about what you as individuals can do as you proceed through your education, you think about your grounding. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about, or mostly about the kind of, skills, qualities, values, and so forth that are the build a foundation of who you are as an individual and a planner to be able to gird yourself and withstand a lot of those headwinds and pressures. But um, we can't do it alone and we can't battle the weaponized politicians who are using our divisions to, um, using our differences to divide us. What we found in Detroit in our neighborhood framework studies was we gathered a group of local youth from the community in which we were working and train them and made them the ambassadors of the planning process. So I would suggest to talking to your planning directors about finding ways to involve the youth strategically in the process, because when they were delivering the planning messages to their neighbors, the NIMBYs had to be quiet. I mean, it was just really an amazing thing to witness and something that I personally have been building on since then involving youth. Um, the other thing is a matter of context and perspective about the crisis, the housing crisis. And I was mentioning to John, and you know, I think the structures that are that we have to go through right now um, have to be blown up. We just have to blow that shit up 
and re, re, rethink it. Um, I'm, uh, I'm the vice chair of uh, a, a community development finance institution called Century Housing. And we finance affordable housing in the state of California. We have over $300 million deployed out in the marketplace lending to developers of affordable housing. And you think, you know, over that much money and those with that many projects, and yet it's a minuscule dent in the big picture. So it's no joke. Um, and how we, if, if we're repeating the same thing and we're trying to execute through those same structures, uh, we'll get the same result. That's not working. So we got to do something better. I don't know if you guys have my deck. There we go. So I am a principal with ZGF and I want you to look at those words because they are powerful, easy to say, a lot harder to live into. But I have to say that when you have that opportunity to try to stand not on the side of the table with your planning colleagues, but on the side of the table with community residents and recite those words, nothing about us without us is for us. And then really feel the obligation to try to live into those words something transformational happens to you as an individual, to you as a professional, a planning professional, and it sort of recenters your, your will at the end of the day to overcome a lot of this. It does require will. So let's start with uh, what I'm going to talk about in seven minutes. Um, our value systems, our necessary skills, the challenges we face, and ultimately building the right team because it takes a village. Next. Uh, you know, as an architect, a designer, an urban designer, having a presentation with no images in it was really hard for me, but I, I'd want to talk too much about the pictures, so I'm just going to leave you with the words. Um, these are a set of values that I think apply across a lot of disciplines if you want to really be ultimately effective and you want to go to your grave knowing you left it all in the field and that you have no regrets. So um, these things take um, a lot of centering and a lot of looking in the mirror and a lot of support from colleagues and friends and family to be able to, you know, these, these things all together, I think, uh, can be reduced to a single word, which is courage. We need courage, okay? And I, I'll make this available so that you don't have to worry about reading all the words right now. Um, core values, some of them are repeated. We certainly have to listen well. We're in a new era of engagement. Um, unfortunately, it took the death of George Floyd to pull the covers back over conditions and situations that we as people of color have been aware of and lived navigating between two streams our whole lives. Um, and for a majority culture of folks who weren't necessarily aware, um, the light was shine, shown on it. And now I don't think there's any going back. So we have an awareness now. And that awareness says that we have to understand and be empathetic and step into the shoes of the other to really try to understand and, and appreciate um, the challenges. People are resilient. They will find a way where there is no way. Um, there are a lot of those kinds of expressions in the Black community. Oh, we'll find a way where there is no way. And those uh, historically coming out of <laughs> three, 400 years of that oppression and slavery to a point where we are now um, is just evidence that the human uh, resilience is something we have to respect and, and capitalize on. Um, so yeah, good. Uh, skills. You know, if you're starting out, you're going to be staff. Um, I'll get to the team at the end, but working with your colleagues, unifying yourselves around the things that you can agree on, have a consensus about, and then using those, clarifying those so that leadership, whether it's the mayor or the assistant mayor or the city council, hears a story in a way that's compelling. That's where the change can occur. And I mean, you guys are really, you know, great and impressive because you're real. You speak in real, real terms to your constituents. And I think that's why you're elected and perhaps reelected. Um, and yet you go in and face those same challenges every day. Uh, how do we get better? How do we do better? And it really takes a village, right? Um, I love this mantra that we had in Detroit, planning to stay. You have longtime residents who stayed in Detroit, and I was speaking to a few of you about this earlier, uh, through the days where Detroit really experienced decline. And they stayed for two reasons. They're either incredibly proud of being a Detroiter and refused to move, which were the few, and most who couldn't afford to move out when everyone else could. That left behind a concentration of poverty, hopelessness, and despair. 
And now that Detroit has experienced its newest renaissance, thanks to Dan Gilbert and Quicken Loans and the Fortune 500s that he dragged into the Detroit, which are now transforming this, the city again, you have um, a lot of young, upwardly mobile, predominantly white professionals moving into those neighborhoods because they can buy a house. And the sidewalk that was cracked because of the tree root for 10 years that the neighbors had been calling about every day that never got fixed, all of a sudden there's a new neighbor on the corner and that sidewalk gets fixed that next week and people wanna know, uh-oh, what's happening? Well, yeah, the rents start going up right away and the property values are increasing. So there's two vulnerable populations there. One of them are seniors that are on fixed incomes. They own their homes, but if property taxes increase beyond their cost of living annual increases, they're threatened with, um, you know, pst. so the mayor in Detroit, Mike Duggan, managed to negotiate and legislate an alignment between annual property tax increases to match the annual cost of living increases, thus allowing those homeowners to remain intact. The other vulnerable population, of course, are renters, because there's nothing you can really do if you're renting a place and the property values go up and your landlord raises a rent. We created a program called Bridging Neighborhoods, where we took all the city owned, and there's lots of city owned houses in Detroit, and renovated them. And the mayor made a commitment to any Detroit resident who wants to remain a Detroit resident, if they get priced out of their, their rental property, has an opportunity to move into another rental property within the 139 square mile boundary of the city of Detroit, which doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna get an equally good neighborhood, but you know, there's this thing about being a Detroiter. So anyway, policy, policy, policy. Um, you know, funding limitations, you know, small gestures matter. We as a planning department went out into a neighborhood one time where there was a lot of accidents on this particular street. We took a rubber mat that was about 60 feet long and we rolled it out and we used a template and we painted white stripes on the rubber mat. Then we rolled it up again and we took it to the intersection. And when there was a break in the traffic, we unfurled the crosswalk right like that, boom. By that time we'd had about 30 neighbors just show up and people in their cars just leaning and looking. And it was just an act of will. Well, we discovered in that process, if we do small gestures and we, and we allow community members to participate in that, painting a, um, a, a logo on the street in a neighborhood by a new park, the sense of ownership, the sense of pride, the sense of care immediately is transferred to them. And I think that's kind of, you know, small little gestures, but big lessons learned. And I love, um, and I learned this from Mayor Duggan, you know, bend policy to the max and, until it almost breaks, but doesn't. You know, that's how we're gonna get policy change. That's how we're gonna make some progress. And then, you know, gather as many resources as you can, involve young people. I didn't put that on the slide, but involve the youth because they are the greatest ambassadors to overcome NIMBYism and to become you all, the next you guys and the next us. So I'll leave it at that and we can um, get into some Q and A maybe. After, uh... Okay, uh, after hearing our speakers, I've renamed our panel the Rebel Alliance. Uh, it sounds, uh, and again, this is the future that we're talking about. Um, I have a question for the three of you, um, and I was struggling how to phrase this, so I'll just come out and say it. Um, each of you at some point kind of touched on the political process. Um, traditionally, the, the political process is, a, is ultimately an exercise in compromise. Um, when you compare that to the challenges that we all face today, and I think everybody in this room can rattle off five or six relatively quickly, um, and we don't seem to be making much movement on some of those. Um, what's your different ideas um, or your reaction to my statement that political is compromise? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Or how should we be changing that? I think you have an easy answer, but. Can you be, what, what are you saying? Like politics, uh, like solutions require compromise? Okay, well, okay, I'll put it, in, I'll rephrase it then in a, in a slightly different way is one of my reactions is everyone in this room knows what these issues are. 
mm-hmm. yet there's an assumption that someone else is working on them, that it's someone else's problem. I know all about climate change, but I personally can't uh, stop sea level rise. Uh, I know the price of housing in my community is extremely high, but what can I do? I just own a home or rent a home or like to rent a home. Um, that's someone else's decision, usually at an elected levels. Yeah, I mean, the beauty of organizing is you can tell people, do you look at this shared problem that we have. Here is a very specific thing you can do to help fix it. That's what we do. So I hope that would give you sort of a way forward for these particular issues you mentioned. Um, and, you know, I think when it comes to compromise, people need to understand the trade-offs that they're making through the planning process. So if you decide that you're not gonna build enough housing for the people who work uh, in, your, in your jurisdiction or in your region, that means that the, uh, the cost of rental homes is gonna skyrocket, you're gonna have displacement and you're gonna have higher homelessness. And so I think we all should work together to make sure that people understand, you know, when we strike these compromises, what the trade-offs are. Is this working? So I will go back to what I mentioned in my presentation. First of all, I think um, compromise, if it's in the form of collective working, breaking silos, then it's meaningful. If you're coming together and brainstorming on different issues, that is not necessarily our area of expertise, but getting the other person's lens into that and kind of like understanding it and kind of like trying to be part of the problem solving. Yes, I think that makes a lot of sense. The other thing is that I totally agree with you. People need to know what they're giving up and what they're getting. Um, I want to bring an example of like in one of our projects in Fresno, uh, which we, again, was one of the Transform the Climate Communities Program projects. The community requested uh, to build a park for kids uh, in a daycare facility next to a highway. And this came from the community. This isn't something that we proposed or any of that. And we us trying to really empower the community to make their own decision. It was a really tough call. Like, do we really need to put the state's dollars in building a park for toddlers next to highway? And, uh, but it was kind of like a challenge, right? Empowering people or like something that we inherently not sure if it's a good idea. And, it took us a while, but we figured out actually we need to get all the facts to the community and let them decide. We, that's what we did. We gave them all the knowledge that we had, everything that we knew that factual science base. And throughout the process, we also understood that some of the things that we assumed were not necessarily correct. And we presented that to the community. Like with all the knowledge that you have in hand, do you want to move forward with funding this park for your kids? At the end of the day, after a lot of discussion, they decided not but we didn't make a decision for them. We just gave them the facts and they moved forward. So that would be my answer. Did you offer them, I often say that before you can take a bone away from a dog, you have to give them a meatier bone and they'll take their attention over there. Did you, were you able to give them an option, an alternative uh, location? Uh, we had, uh, there was a pot of money. They could use the money for something ah, else. Okay, all right. Well, I wanna agree with both my colleagues. Um, I think, Compromise um, is a necessary part of a process. Again, if it's structured in a way, and this gets to my point of depersonalizing issues, what happens is too often contentious issues come onto the table and they're immediately they're assigned to personalities and individuals and you get into, you know, that you lose sight of the issue itself. So having a skill, of depersonalizing contentious issues and keeping the focus on the facts, the alternatives, the consequences, because someone I believe said there are always gonna be winners and losers, right? That's an, an, an unfortunate fact, but the needs of the many in an ideal situation will outweigh the needs of the few. And so, being able to manage a process, being able to be a, an effective facilitator where, again, the focus is not allowed to become on individuals, but to be 
you know, focused on the on the issues at hand, is um, I think a way to get to a kind of consensus decision, uh, where again the voices of the constituents are the ones that are facilitated in a way where they get they're making the decisions for the right reasons, more facts and less emotion, perhaps, right? And for the record, you just made a Star Trek reference and I made a Star Wars reference. So we are very inclusive here today. Okay, very good. Um, so I think at this point, we'll take some questions. Uh, we have about another uh, half hour. So do we have someone with the mic or I can repeat the question? Okay, so who, who wants to be first? Who wants to ask a question of the room? Okay, in the back there. Yes. Even better, you don't have a microphone. If I can figure out how to turn this on. Is it on? Is it on? Okay, it is. Uh, that's a great discussion. And what it got me thinking about on the concept of compromise, um, a theme that kept coming across was that, gosh, we just can't do anything that fast. Politics whipsaw things um, and we're, we're compromising what we really wanna do. What I'm thinking, and I'm a professional planner, I'm a consultant, I work with a lot of cities. Um, what I find is, is that at the architecture review level, planning commission level, perfectly engaged, great ideas. It's when you get to the council level or the board where the politics go sideways. And so what I'm thinking is, and react to this in one way or another, for the biggest picture issues, setting policies on three pages, here are the 20 things we wanna do. Council approves that, and maybe even a general plan. But when it comes to approving the projects and the actions that flow from that, that it's left to the professional staff as advised by the advisory committees, taking out the political realm, except for the extent of setting policy or the budgets, and then leaving it to the directors to get things going and, and going through the secret process and whatever, cutting out the dates that, oh, we can't get this for two years, the politics change. If the paradigm was shifted to some model more like that, do you think things would be more effectively implemented down the road? Hell yeah. Um, I, I also, I think in preparation for this, we talked a little bit about uh, loss of local control and, and state law. And, and I think it would be great to see a future where planners are excited about the loss of local control, right? You can just be like, well, that's above my pay grade. You know, these decisions are made at the state. Um, and I hope that's the future. It would be inappropriate from someone from the state to talk about local control. <laughs> One of the strategies under, you know, being very aware of that challenge of council and getting things to a point, we, we always had individual council briefings with the council members where we would paint the upside, be very transparent about what the, you know, potential sacrifices that would be, need to be made, you know, politically or economically or what have you. But at the end of the day, presenting that information in a way where they could start to imagine and we give them like not talking points necessarily, but thinking points um, so that at the end of the day, we would have the consensus before it even went to council vote. So I think you have to be strategic uh, working within the political environment that you are in. And Detroit had a very strong city council, happened to have a stronger mayor. Um, and we did and have continued to get a lot of things done. I'm no longer there, but I'm still kind of there, you know, um, so I keep track of my, my staff. I'm still on my staff's uh, text string. So I see the good, the bad, and the ugly every day. And right here in front. I can hand you mine, because that's faster. Okay, so, um, oh wow, that sounds loud. Um, so I have some, I have basically two questions, but they're kind of related. So I've been hearing sort of like almost uh, dual narratives. One is the importance of public outreach and getting into the community and understanding what people want, but then also like dealing with or ignoring NIMBYs slash Karens. So as a planner, what are strategies that you should use if you, if you have a, a project 
you know, for housing or for a bike path or whatever it is that you think or you know is a good idea. When you do the public outreach, people, it's like you hear the opposite response from what you want. And related to that, there might be people who are neither NIMBYs or YIMBYs, maybe they're in a convincible category. How much should it be the role of a planner in government to serve as you know, sort of a convincer or as someone to represent these ideas and convince people in the community. Um, and I ask that because I've seen for a lot of local projects, you know, a planner, they're almost put on the stand, right? There's a road diet and they have to defend the ideals of the road, why road diets are a good idea. And the city council, you know, almost it's like an inquisition. So how much should there, do you think there needs to be sort of where the planner can actually express their opinions or try and convince more members of the public? I'll be quick. I think it's leadership. Um, that's why there is a director. Uh, the director has the gravitas and the authority to engage in that manner. Staff is standing there right behind that person um, with the facts. Uh, but I think we have to listen to all points of view. And if you're a NIMBY and you don't care about the facts, you just are emotionally driven about something, you know, there's really, I can't deal with with that, I respect you, all right, but let's move on and then let's see what the consensus turns out to be. And then at the end of the day, honestly, if the feedback from the constituents and the community comes back not in agreement, you gotta kind of live with that. You gotta go back to the drawing board, literally, and sort of figure out, okay, what are we trying to achieve and how, what are other ways we can do that and then get them involved in the construction of those thoughts and ideas. So to your first question, I think, um, you know, at UMB Action, what we're trying to do is create a structure for you all so that you're not sort of burned at the stake or, you know, at the Inquisition or something um, so that you can be like, you know, this is the this is the system, like this is the, the venue, you know, at the general plan level or the regional plan, plan level. This is the venue where your concerns are heard and these are the these are the decisions that you have as a community. What are the uses? Um, what uh, what are the changes we want to see? And making sure that's at the right level so that there isn't this backlash at the, the project by project level. Um, the other thing that I think we've like circled around a bunch today is, is also a Star Trek reference, um, which is a quote, it, the truth must be won. I'll see you on the battlefield. That is my job. <laughs> like, it, 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 it's sure there are some people who they're going to see the facts, they're going to see the, you know, the PSAs or the mailers and be like, yep, I'm going to do it. And there are a lot of people who, as you know, are going to have to be convinced. And there was an excellent question earlier about misinformation. Um, you need to just look at the sort of state of national discourse in our country to know that facts are not enough. You got to fight for them. I, I want to add something, even though I'm the moderator. My, my day job is I do process projects. I've been um, a planner on the governmental side, and I am now the applicant for a lot of different projects, including several housing projects. Um, so I think one of the, the, the root of the question also is, or to phrase it a different way, the opponents will always be loud. Um, but your job either as the planner or the applicant or the proponent for a particular project is to try and gauge the depth of the opposition. You may be loud, but they may be few. The quiet are rarely the ones that are gonna come out in numbers. So that's something as, as you look at a project in particular, you try and gauge very early on the process and try and engage all the way through because you know there are going to be opponents. Uh, one of the jokes I like to say is uh, my job as a, as a land planner is probably 90% change management and 10% land use planning because that's really what we're doing on a daily basis. So I would say um, the scale matters. And if the job has been done, the engagement has been done meaningfully in every scale. And what that means is like, if you have done the general plan engagement in a meaningful way, and if the entire community and your council is on board, what different like direction that you're going, then that's job number one. And then, this, then the tears for that, it needs to trickle down. And if you're getting into the neighborhood level, 
And there is a general consensus that you need a bike lane. Yes, there is a bike lane. Is it like exactly this street, next to street? That's something that the community should have a choice in it for multiple reasons. There is one part of the story. The other is that um, people approach topics from different perspective. And I had very eye-opening um, experience that I would like to reference to. We were like planning a bike path um, in a, a community, low-income South Asian community, mainly African-American. And everybody wants it. Who doesn't want trees? Who doesn't want bike paths? Like, yeah, this is, we we're so proud of ourselves, like going to the neighborhood with this whole great investments that we are doing. And then we had like a meeting with uh, some folks from neighborhood and they were very upset. And uh, like my staff was telling me, yes, this group is really upset. They keep coming. So like, let's meet with them, see what's going on. And my was like, this should be some nonsense. Then when I got to meet them, it suddenly clicked that where they're coming from. They were like, you're not coming here to give me a bike path. You're coming here to take my land away. You're coming here to make the properties more valuable so you can push me out. They had like fundamentally disbelief that this is for them. And that's what I understood. Like, actually, there's a point here. And there's a valid point here that we need to approach it from that perspective versus like, oh, bike path is great. Why don't you want the bike path? And so like you wealthy people are getting in your fancy cars driving and want me to drive my bike? Go to hell, no, I don't want that. So it was kind of like, oh, you're right. So we had to go back, go back to basic and talk to them and make sure that we're all on the same page what we're trying to achieve there and make sure that we're all like understanding where this is coming from. And it really meets the needs of the community. That's what I would suggest. So they're like more into that, just like, oh, this is like, but we don't want the bike lane, so. I have to just riff on that for a minute because um, in Detroit, we had a similar reaction. They're like, oh, you wanna bring these bike paths in, you know, so that you can sort of fertilize the land for new crops to grow. And uh, yet 33% of residents of the Motor City don't own cars. So they really did need bicycles and safe ways to connect to the resources of outside of their community. So at the end of the day, by just again presenting facts, um, we started to, for example, there are these um, myths about black people, right? Black people don't swim, they don't ride bikes, whatever. So we photographed all these residents taking pictures of butterfly gardens, riding bicycles through the neighborhoods. And we made this great uh, presentation and, and shared it. And you know, people could see themselves represented in those images and said, eh, okay, maybe. maybe We'll put a bike rental facility there and you know if you have kids they can get them for free whatever you know just connecting with those residents so i'm, I'm i feel you yeah for, thanks very much for the panel and for the presentations, very enlightening. Um, and um, of course, as a basically a faculty, I need to be kind of a provocateur, right? Like try to extend the discussion a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> so um, three things call my attention in what you guys said. Uh, one is um, I'm glad that after 50 years of uh, a little book called After the Planners, you're finally talking to the community to find out what they want, right? So uh, I'm glad that you're talking about uh, participatory budget, which is something that was invented in Brazil, where I come from, uh, and it has its downfalls, but it's, it's a good start. The other thing is that I think that you guys touch on something that's very important, which um, I think was a little bit on the surface, is like we all need to drop down our values and rethink them because the planning uh, decisions and the planning mandates, the planning regulations, it's us who do them, right? So if you look at other countries, they're, they're less, they're less uh, in positive, they're more flexible. Who says every room has to have ventilation? In Portugal, there are lots of bedrooms that have no windows and people survive, right? So what's the problem with that? Um, why do you need to change the percep per perception and say, okay, if you talk about sustainability, let's then mandate that all the, all the bathrooms have a window. 
that's much more interesting than having bedrooms with windows, right? All the, all the bathrooms, according to code, has forced ventilation 24-7. Why why, my house has a bathroom in the middle that shouldn't be there. Okay, so that's one. So we have to drop out, drop down our own values in designing all these regulations. The other thing that I would like to <clears throat> call attention to, I think it's something that Stephen taught, touched a little bit. It came to my mind when you spoke, the need to destroy the system. And I thought about a little book I, I <clears throat> read when I was an architecture student called Housing by People by John Turner. He said that housing is a verb. And you all talked about housing as a product. Let's produce more housing. Let's produce more housing. That's not the answer. You never reach it. You have to produce things that lead to housing. Housing is not the important thing. The important thing is to have a lot of infrastructure with water, with access to transportation, to jobs. And then whoever gets that lot builds the house over time. That's the least important factor in the whole housing process. So I, we got to change our values and our perspectives. Otherwise, things are not going to change at all. And I also think that, although I agree with you that we have to mandate sometimes a lot of things from the state level and federal level. But of course, you guys know how dangerous that is. I can point you to two or three projects in San Obispo that have affordable housing. Thus, they can bypass a lot of local laws and the projects suck. I wouldn't buy a house there because they went over the local uh, uh, <clears throat> requirements. So that's uh, a little dangerous too, right? Anyway, yeah, I just that, wanted to that, that raise was the questions. second longest question I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like it's it's a it's a, a exercise. I'm exercising my mind. Yes. No. No. I I uh, I would add to that and maybe throw that an, another factor to the to the crowd. We we are very, with, with the exception of Stephen on the end, you know, we're all kind of California centric. Right, we're we're in we're school here. I've worked in California all my career. Um, who took my CRP three hundred and sixteen class, students? Okay, oh, too many, too many. <laughs> okay, one of the things I talked about was the fiscalization of land use that occurred post Prop thirteen in nineteen seventy six. So one of the things that we deal with all the time in on our day to day world is this issue of uh, an analysis, a fiscal analysis of a land use that takes away or has greater presence over things like housing. Oh, well, we need a Costco because that pays back to the community. Housing never pays for itself. Um, so again, I now I'm talking and I didn't ask a question, but uh, what are your the three of your kind of reactions to this kind of fiscalization of land use aspect? Well, I have a reaction to some of his comments. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I live next to a big public park, you know, a lot, as you said, that has utilities, it has water, it has, um, you know, electricity in the bathrooms, right, the public bathrooms, and there are 10 people who live there. They would not call it housing. Like, I... I disagree with you and your point about about the lots um and uh and I want to emphasize too that the state laws that have been brought down that I've advocated for are rooted in these planning processes that cities conduct themselves right these larger these larger plans these larger general plans um and so I think that that is you know I'm not saying abolish planning. <laughs> I'm saying abolish project by project decision making and nonsense. So what I will mention here doesn't represent the state of California view. It's my personal view and I'm exercising my mind too. <laughs> Just want to point that out. There are a couple of things that were really interesting in um, the gentleman's uh, uh, comments, which, uh, I would like to mention is uh, go back to the compromise. When you have local laws and rules, 
that don't produce, that's when you force the state to come down with a hammer. If you don't want to happen, make it happen locally. Showcase that you can do it. You can do it for the good of your people. And that's where you like, okay, we actually build projects that meets our community need, but also sees the people that are on the margin and don't have a voice. So people in the Sacramento wouldn't have come to say like, okay, okay, let's see what we can do. And, and then in some cases, Huntington Beach, we have actually to get the attorney general involved to be able to make them to comply with the housing law. So that being said, also wanted to mention that um, uh, housing is a very complex topic. Housing is not only uh, four walls, it's more, it connects to people identity, it connects to the community and all of that. And we should see the housing with a bigger picture. So affordable housing doesn't need to be a housing that doesn't need a doesn't have a quality. So for affordable housing developers, I have overseen the probably the largest affordable housing uh, program in the state, affordable housing sustainable communities program that gives $900 million annually to the affordable housing. We want to see good projects. These people deserve to live in good places. They don't need to be in a places that don't meet the qualifications of like a dig like dignified people. Like we want people to have access to good housing and in the right places. I agree with you. You can't have people live out there in the middle of nowhere and then expect them to have a life and have like access to parks, services. And then like, then you are forcing them to buy a car, which can't, they can't afford. And they have to uh, wait for a bus for that middle of nowhere house that could just only serve them probably every one hour. And then what does that mean? We need to put them in a place that they can actually build some wealth. They can have access to jobs. They can have access to services. Their kids can go to the schools. And like uh, furthering fair housing, very important. Like we don't want people in the places that we have concentrated poverty. So those all, they're the things that I wanna like ask everyone to pay attention. I have international development background. I have worked in other countries and there are places that people, not in the US, we have too much laws and regulation for that to happen in general, but people leave, how, like, leave on the banks of rivers. That's too dangerous, but they leave there because they want to have access to jobs. That's where they can save some money to actually go and buy a house. So see housing as a complex totality, not a four walls. Amen. In Harlem, New York, where my dad grew up, uh, we did. A, he was an architect, and we did a lot of our work in his firm in, in Harlem. And um, there was a project done in the seventies called Taino Towers. And there were these two beautiful white architectural icons built overlooking the East River, and they were all deeply affordable. And on the New York Times. The headline was something terrible about affordable housing for, it was disparaging. I, I wish I didn't just have a brain fart about the, 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 um, the headline, but it was like the whole calling into question whether low income people had the right to live in, oh, luxury living for the poor. That was the headline, luxury living for the poor. And it wasn't anything particularly luxurious about the housing. It was just beautiful architecture, um, very nice location. And yet that line was being drawn, you know, and I think I really, I mean, the problem, my man, is uh, we live in America, a land of the free, home of the brave. You know, I mean, this is about individual rights and the insistence, insistence upon individual rights to the detriment of the greater society. And so the, the pendulum swings between the more socialist ideas and the more nationalistic ideas and never you know, will it rest in one ideal place. It seems to always be in flux. Um, we're at a point right now where it's, it's make it or break it time in many respects. So it takes a collective energy and a collective effort um, to push forward the things that may require a small individual sacrifice, but for a much greater gain for the society, a way to provide hope and inspiration to particularly our young people who will grow into these positions of leadership in the future. You all are the next at bat, you know, I'm like 
in the manager's box now, you know, but you guys are, you know, up, up to bat. And then the ones who are, you know, the ball boys and girls, um, they're next. We got to do something to make sure they can hit when they get to the, to the league. I was told by a client last week in Boulder, Colorado, that I get paid by the metaphor, so. <laughs> okay, I think we have one more question. Uh, how about way over there? Uh -oh. I, I'll come to you with them. Um, so this is a symposium on the future of planning. Um, and what I'm asking is planning is really um, a process of guidance. And if you can comment on what are the skill sets that young planners or new planners or even experienced planners need to have in order to practice that guidance, to practice guidance in a way that leads to social betterment. Because the whole function of city planning ever since the Romans was to figure out how to find places for people to live and to do trade and to be governed you know, in the new spaces that gets built over time. So as a process of guidance, what are the skills that someone needs to learn or practice moving forward? That's my question. I would take that as someone that literally hires people on a daily basis. Uh, when it comes to like what you need to learn, you can learn topical issues easily. It's not rocket science. You can learn about housing by sitting down, reading books, like takes a couple of months any topic. What is not easy is training your mindset to be problem solver, know how to be actually someone that can facilitate, you know, different, you know, opinions to come to a consensus and build some of the soft skills. That's what I'm really looking for when I'm looking for a planner. That's the part that I can really have a hard time to teach to someone if you haven't been able to build that while you're in a school. How like you, the Issues related to planning are complex, very complex. It touches every part of the human being as a whole. So you need to be like, learn to look systematically, learn to know how to look for uh, new you know, resources, be open to educate yourself in whatever it is. Today's pressing issue is climate change. Okay, but it's intertwined with housing. I don't want someone's like, housing is not my area. Just ask somebody else. No, I want you to go and learn. That's what I'm really looking for. Yeah, I mean, curiosity is absolutely uh, essential, as well as, as we've talked about this whole day, having a thick skin. Um, something that I learned, I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old at home. Uh, they don't know the difference between work and play. They're like, you know, they go to preschool, right? They, they build stuff, they do stuff. And um, in my work and, and in my housing work, I have been able to find ways that make my work feel more like play and bringing joy into my work. And that is a skill that I think would serve everybody well. Awesome, because I was gonna say, I'm just like your kids, you know? <laughs> they say, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And uh, I feel that way very much. But um, I, I wanna be more um, tactical about that question. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, Stephen Covey, who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, the most impactful thing he said in there, well, he said two things. He said, uh, begin with the end in mind. Well, how do you arrive at that end? Well, through a consensus community engagement process, and you determine what that outcome wants to be, and then you reverse engineer it as a planner. You use your skills and your tactics and everything else. The other thing he said, which may not relate exactly to our conversation, but is worth saying is, and this goes to nimbyism and other kinds of issues that why self-reflection on an ongoing basis and continuous improvement are such important characteristics that we have to be courageous enough to have is you can expend as much energy as any other person to work toward a goal only to discover, and this is Kobe, that the ladder you've been climbing is leaning against the wrong wall. You know, when you get up there and you've invested so much to get there and this awareness finally is undeniable in front of you do you have the courage to climb back down, re reorient that ladder and begin that process again? 
that's like some deep stuff. So uh, I, I guess I'll leave you with that. I'll, I'll throw in my two cents worth. I, I think you need a sense of optimism. Um, major projects, if, you, if you're fortunate to get into large complicated projects, they will take years. And if you're not optimistic, you're not looking forward to the end goal, you will be discouraged relatively early and you will not have an open mind. You know, what's, what's the other saying? I can throw out sayings too. Um, you know, minds are like parachutes. They both work when they're open. So um, that's, that's the attitude that you need to have as a planner because you may not have out the answers. You may have the answers and not be asked, um, but you still need to have this vision of where you're, you're going with things. So with that, we're at the, the 2.30 mark. I wanna thank everybody for attending. Uh, it also occurred to me that yesterday was 4.20 day. So I wanna thank everybody for remembering to come. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Amir. Thank you so much. Thank you for the panelists. I think our students got a quarter long learning, le possibly semester long learning lesson in an hour. Thank you so much. And thank you, Bill Simbieta for the last question. I was praying someone asked for that question and <laughs> you did. Thank you. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce the last speaker of the day. Uh, we'll having Heidi Womblum. Uh, has 20 years of experience in both public and private land uses and environmental planning law. She's currently the planning director of the city of San Diego. Prior to joining the planning department in 2018, she served as a deputy city attor attorney in the land use advisory and legislation units in the San Diego city attorney's office. Mrs. Wambalam obtained a bachelor of science in city and regional planning at Cal Poly and a juror doctor from the University of San Diego School of Law. Thank you, Heidi. All right, well, thank you for having me. Let me see if I can do this. Never mind. I'll just, uh, I'll just, I'll just, do I have a presentation? Wonderful. Okay. Well, um, I do want to first um, off acknowledge that I did graduate from this school over 20 years ago. So I'm very happy to be back. It looks different. It looks better. Um, I will particularly thank Jacob Howard, who is in the audience here, who was my advisor um, and my studio teacher um, and really, you know, set me on my path forward. So uh, thank you for everything. Um, it's been fascinating listening to different perspectives. Um, I do just want to uh, couch um, all of the things that I will be sharing with you that um, I am fortunate and I'm, I'm partial to big cities. Um, and I am fortunate that I do work as a planning director for the eighth largest city in the country. We have 1.3 million people. Uh, we have a very diverse population. Uh, we serve all, uh, all kinds of different communities. Uh, we have 42 different community planning areas. Most of our community planning areas are larger than the size of most medium-sized jurisdictions throughout the state of California. Um, so a lot of um, you know, what I, I share here today um, is really representative of the fact that big cities do have different sets um, and types of challenges with different types of solutions. So not saying this is you know, the solution everywhere um, within our particular jurisdiction, uh, we have um, really taken the approach just over the past couple of years to switch things up. So, um, and then I will also make a plug for the, you know, this, the state, uh, the lack of local control. Sometimes we like to lack local control, but sometimes lack of local control is really problematic um, for us as a big city, um, especially when it comes to equitable engagement. Um, a lot of our community members are not able to engage at that statewide level, whereas we are more uniquely able to do that. Um, I understand the reason for taking away local control, uh, which is when cities are bad actors. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not providing housing. They are saying no to doing the right thing. City of San Diego, I'm very proud to say, is a designated pro-housing city. Um, and I would like some local control with that. Um, so, um, you know, we are gathered here today. We are here to talk about the future of planning. 
Um, and I wanna make a plug for my city um, that I have served for 15 years. Um, we uh, really have through multiple um, iterations um, of politicians. Um, we have gone from a city of largely uh, Republican uh, representation on our city council to currently we have a Democratic mayor as well as um, a 9-0 Democratic majority on our city council. Uh, politics do matter um, in what you can do and the ways that you can do it, um, but through um, different leadership um, I, am, I am very happy to say that we have had the support of our leadership um, at all levels to say yes um, to housing and yes to good planning for the most part in the recent history. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, we do have a mayor right now, Mayor Todd Gloria, um, that does um, enable me to do my job, um, to embrace challenges, embrace change, um, and really find solutions to really incredible problems that we do face right now. Um, I will put a plug in uh, that um, a lot of people see challenges as problems. Um, they really are opportunities. Um, you know, when we talk about what are we looking for in the next generation of planners, we're looking for people that can find solutions. We do not need any more people that can find challenges and problems. Uh, we need people that can find solutions um, to very, very complex problems. Um, so, um, you know, we're here to talk about the future planning, um, ways that we are changing, status quo busting. Um, I do have a legal background, um, which I do love uh, because it has enabled me to lead my team to challenge why things are the way they are. Certain rules say this, policies say this, why do they say it? Ask it five times, why do they say it? Um, and what do we need to do to change it? Um, so I'm gonna run through some of the reasons why change is needed. Um, and I will highlight what that looks like in my city. Um, and um, some of the things that we're doing um, to change that. So if I can get a next slide. Um, so, and I, and I kind of want to give a little bit of background here. We've brought forward a couple of major, major, major uh, change uh, initiatives in the last couple of years that are very hard to get political and community support for. And one of the things uh, that um, has enabled us to be able to get that is through pictures. Um, we find that a lot of people that um, participate in the planning um, space um, happen to be more privileged um, and they happen to live in places that look a little bit nicer and they don't understand what the problems are until you take them there. Um, but we are a very large jurisdiction. We have 42 different communities. It can take an hour to get from one place of the city to another. Um, and so we showed up in all of the communities uh, during COVID because we had a little bit of, you know, we thought, you know, hey, let's just go do it. Um, so we photo documented conditions throughout our city. Um, what you will see on the left is conditions primarily in the north, more affluent parts of our city. Conditions on the right are more um, uh, are traditionally underserved, structurally excluded communities, primarily in the south of our city. So here, parks, differences. Um, next slide. Playgrounds, um, you know, you can kind of guess uh, what are well-resourced communities, which ones are not. Um, next slide. Basketball courts. Um, one, this one also happens to have lighting that extends the use um, and value of that resource to a community. Next slide. Sidewalks, um, big differences. Next slide. Uh, bicycle lanes or lack thereof, bicycle safety. Next slide. Um, and then also just housing typologies, um, conditions of homes, um, and then over concentration of affordable housing in certain part of our, parts of our city as well. Um, next slide. Let's see what else is here. Okay, so redlining. Um, so um, I will um, say um, here that uh, we have very different outcomes um, in the north and south of our city. Um, and I will also say that the outcomes are not random. They were planned by planners um, in very general terms. Um, some people have had it very good. These are the more affluent areas. Um, and they have um, received significant community investments, uh, very thriving communities. Um, and in areas in the South, primarily, there have been disinvestments in those communities um, with very real consequences. So uh, why, how did we end up here? Um, there is lots of reasons. It's never as simple as like a two minute soundbite that I may be able to share with you today, but I will say that maps don't tend to lie. Um, they can, depending on the data and who informs them, but for the most part, they don't tend to lie. 
Um, so going um, back to the areas of our city that were redlined, areas that essentially resulted in a de facto ban on home ownership opportunities in areas where not coincidentally residents were black. So overlaying map layers of redlined areas on top of areas that have received the least amount of investments are telling. Um, you can see redlined areas here. Um, areas uh, with darker colors have received more investments than areas in red. Um, and um, basically um, there has been um, a continuous thing. I could overlay so many map layers uh, that my department has. We have like bananas levels of data. I could overlay, these are just two examples and I have my staff do this for pretty much every exercise that we do to see you know, what is going on here um, because the, the disparities are really stark um, and it's something that we need to address. So um, let's go to the next slide. All right. So I think Stephen, you said it, um, and I pulled some quotes from an old white guy. Um, <laughs> um, but that are, you know, but that are telling. So um, basically, we can't expect different outcomes when we do the same things that we've always done. Um, what do we hear when we got to communities? We hear this is different the context is like different is bad. And I'm like, cool, it's different. That's good, right? Um, but a lot of people think that, that different is bad, different is untested. I mean, I could probably spend an hour telling you all the things that I have been told about things that we are changing. Um, a lot of what we hear is, hasn't been tried out before. Um, and you know, well, we have tried out a lot of things and they haven't worked out. Um, they have worked out for some, um, but they really have not worked out um, for many um, in our city. Um, and um, it's important to remember that um, as we go through it. So um, next slide. Um, so really what we're looking for is not to do the same thing, uh, which is hard because um, the same thing is what we know, it's what we learn. Um, and that's why when we are looking for new talent, we are looking people for people that can come up with solutions. Um, and then, you know, everybody here is probably also wanting to talk about housing, 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 housing. That's what we talk about all the time now. That's like all we talk about over the last couple of years, housing climate, right? Um, so in addition, in addition to addressing historical inequities, um, we also do need to address a severe lack of affordable housing in our state. Um, it's a crisis. When you are in a crisis, you don't do the same thing. You do things a little bit differently to get out of a crisis. So. Um, you guys are all professionals. I'm not speaking to a group of community members, so I will spare you the statistics, the numbers, et cetera. Um, at the end of the day, we have a people focus um, in the planning that we do. I think we have an obligation to be people-centered in what we do. So this means that people are not numbers. Um, they are people that can't afford to pay their rent, let alone own a home. They are people that are unhoused, homeless, people that will soon become homeless and also people at all income levels and family sizes that need a home to live in. Without people to live in homes, we cannot fill jobs, we cannot grow our economy, we really don't have a purpose within our city. Uh, we cannot care for each other. Teachers, firefighters, nurses, service workers, all of us, we all need homes. Um, one of the things that I would ask everybody to take away from today is to stop calling them housing units. That really bothers me. It's really impersonal. Um, so I um, have a rule in my department that the word unit is not to be included in any staff report or data or anything that we do. They are called homes. They are homes that people live in. Um, and so that I think um, a lot of the, the stuff that we get out of the state focuses on housing units. Um, I'll probably just go off on a tangent. So excuse the slide for a minute here, but um, Arena numbers, city of San Diego, 108,000 units um, in, our, in our cycle. That's a lot of units. That's more than you know, most people have in their whole cities. Um, they're not just units, right? If we build 108,000 units, those units could be micro units and they could house 108,000 people. Or those housing units could look like something different, like something that the people that live in my city need to live in. But the state incentivizes units. And so we are getting units we are guiding units in our city, but we are getting micro units. We are not getting the homes um, that our people need. So 
just kind of thinking about things to balance, you know, with state um, legislation versus what we need in our communities. Uh, we do have a mandate to provide them. Uh, we are working on that. It really bothers me that we get the same credit for a micro unit as we do for a three bedroom home that will house a family with children or an intergenerational family with many people living in it. Um, so um, where are we here? Oh yeah, walking and chewing bubble gum at the same time. So I've been at a lot of council hearings and my council members are all very respectful, um, even though they're all over the place and I can never guess you know, where we're gonna go, but um, all very respectful. That has not always been that way. I do appreciate when elected officials are very nice to my staff. Thank you, elected officials that are nice to the staff. It helps us retain, recruit and keep our city running. So um, something to keep in mind there as well. Um, but one of the things that one of our council members said is, so what are we just walking to and bubble gum at the same time here? And I'm like, yeah, we are. Um, because we can't just keep doing things the way that we're doing. You know, if we sit around and, um, you know, we have the answer to every single what if scenario that could possibly come up, we're not going to get anything done. Um, a lot of things that we get challenged on are, well, you haven't solved the entirety of the problem, so let's not do anything. Um, that's also not going to work. Progress is incremental. We cannot solve every single problem, every step along the way, um, but we can have an intentional pathway forward to get us there. Um, and that sometimes means that we don't have answers to every single thing, um, but we have some of the answers. Uh, we're able to build a consensus uh, and be able to move forward. Um, so, um, so that's why that cute little girl, she's gonna go, uh, she's gonna go skating and chew bubble gum at the same time, actually. So if this one can do it, I think we can all do it. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we we all, I think, um, I think it cannot be underestimated the opposition um, that comes from change. It's just, it's like very, very scary to people. Um, and so it's important for us to be respectful um, and have some common shared understandings. Most people, even people that oppose every single thing that we do. Um, can agree on the things that are up here, um, that we need affordable homes, um, we need climate friendly development. Unfortunately, my city does have a climate action plan. Um, it was adopted in 2015, it was most recently updated last year, and of course it's in litigation. Um, um, but um, we, we do have a climate action plan. One of our strategies is solely related around planning. Uh, we have five different strategies. One is completely on the on 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 the shoulders um, of the city planning department, um, and then also protecting the environment. Uh, we also are very blessed to have many natural, wonderful resources within our state. We have um, don't really like to use the term biodiversity or multiple species or anything wonky like that. We have plants and animals that we all enjoy and we would like to protect those as well. Those also happen to align with our climate goals because when we concentrate development located near transit where we can efficiently deliver infrastructure, that's also good for conservation. Um, and um, we hear this a lot. Uh, we also need to provide infrastructure. Um, I would say that um, sometimes that kind of gets annoying of like, you don't have the infrastructure to serve the new development, so you can't have the new development. It's real. We do need infrastructure to serve development. We do need to plan for schools. We do need to plan for parks, uh, water, sewer capacity, roadways. Um, all of that needs to happen um, as part of the planning process. So uh, we're not throwing out planning at all in everything that we do. We are still making sure that we are intentionally planning for our future. Um, one of the, um, let's see. Next slide. All right, so some of the things um, that we are doing um, as uh, a city in San Diego. Uh, first, um, we uh, have a whole branded initiative called Homes for All of Us. Um, and really what that is, is it's not units for some of us, it is homes for all of us. Um, we continually update citywide regulations that streamline the delivery of new homes in all communities. Um, some have said, I've heard it, that we cannot buy right our way out of the housing crisis. Um, well, we are certainly gonna try. Um, we have spent a lot of effort um, to bring forward each year significant incentives to build more homes in areas located closest to transit where the city can most efficiently deliver needed infrastructure. Um, CEQA is a challenge. I don't think there's anybody here maybe that disagrees that we don't need CEQA reform. Um, I'll just put a pitch out for it. You know what the best thing in the world would be for our housing problem is if we could just get an exemption from the legislature for all infill development on previously graded sites that are located within mile of transit. Um, so someday that'll happen. <laughs> 
Um, but in the meantime, uh, we are solutions finders. And so we programmatically address environmental review requirements under CEQA always with an eye towards streamlining future approvals and initiatives. No more of this doing EIRs to do EIRs and have them sit on a shelf. We do EIRs to streamline development. Um, we've also increased our housing capacity through community plan updates. Um, we have had community plan updates um, adopted each year for the past couple of years, increasing um, home capacity by about 30,000 units per community. Remember we have 42,000, 42, 42 total communities. Um, so really um, all of our comprehensive plan updates come with comprehensive rezoning. These are really door busting numbers, um, which again is why I would like to get a little bit of leniency from the state sometimes. Um, let's see, next slide. Uh, we also further fair housing um, and advance anti-racist zoning policies. So this means taking a look at why our city is zoned the way that it is. And oftentimes I could overlay a redlining map on this and it would tell you a story as well. Um, I just didn't have time to do all that before I got here. Um, it took 10 hours to drive here yesterday. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, we kind of hear a lot about advancing equity and um, a lot of times it is seen as lip service. Um, it's really important work. It's stuff that we lead with. My department has what we call a tactical equity plan um, and it really drives every single work program item that we do. Um, really focused on advancing anti-racist zoning policies to further fair housing um, in all of our communities. This means that we need affordable housing for the people that live in low income communities, but we also need affordable housing in all communities so that everybody has the choice, uh, to live in communities that best serve their needs. So, um, does it mean reconsidering protecting community character? Yes, it does. Um, and it's hard. I can assure you it's hard because I don't have a single thing that I have taken to city council that is not under litigation right now. Um, I also have staff that receives hundreds of emails at like four in the morning telling them, you know, that they're doing horrible things to their communities. Um, but, you know, what this change really does mean is it means more, home, home, more homes for more people in all of our communities, people of all incomes, individuals, students, people with disabilities, people with families, with children. Um, and these people that are added to our communities are not a burden. They are new friends, they are new neighbors. New housing does not need to be bad. Um, it can and it should be good. Um, so to that end, a couple of things that the city has done um, in this space is we enthusiastically, our city council did enthusiastically adopt an ADU home density bonus program. We've implemented SB9, allowing up to four units on single family homes. Uh, we recently, just a couple months ago, or maybe just a month ago, adopted a new sustainable development area allowing for increased density in traditionally lower density areas. Um, this includes uh, single family zones. Um, and then we will soon, um, hopefully, um, we're going to hearing soon, uh, we'll be implementing SB 10. I do believe that we will be the first jurisdiction in California um, to implement it, um, if we can get the city council to approve it, um, that will allow up to 10 homes on underdeveloped lots, including single family homes. Thank you to the California legislature for a full CEQA exemption on that one. Um, next slide. Um, so sustainable development, uh, we took SB 743 to a new level. Um, rather than just focusing on CEQA requirements, which is all that SB 743 did, Remember, CEQA applies to discretionary projects. We're moving away from discretionary and moving into ministerial with equitable community buy-in on the overall policies. Um, we adopted what we call our mobility choices program to reduce vehicular travel citywide while providing funding for sidewalks, bike lanes, and transit facilities with priority investments and a commitment to spend at least half of the revenue in underserved and structurally excluded communities. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, this is um, what we did a couple of years ago. Uh, we broke our city up into mobility zones. So mobility zones one, two, three, and four. Mobility zone one is our downtown area. It's very small. It's in the, in the bright blue. Um, mobility zone two are areas located near transit. So these are areas that are approximately half a mile. I have two minutes. Got to go. Okay. Um, that's, that's, I can do that. 
basically, uh, we are taking funding from the yellow areas, which are more affluent, um, where development occurs, and we are funding active transportation investments in the blue areas that happen to overlay with our redlined and structurally excluded communities. Um, next slide. Okay, um, increasing active transportation. I'll just skip that because we don't have time. <laughs> uh, we also were one of the first jurisdictions um, to implement parking reform, which I do not like to refer to as parking reform or parking minimums, but really on limiting the oversupply of parking um, and um, increasing the productive use of land. Next slide. All right, uh, we also carefully looked at how we funded infrastructure from development impact fees. Uh, we did painfully dissect this funding program that had been in place for decades. Um, and that also happened to have disparate and harmful outcomes um, and also inefficient outcomes for everybody. Um, so we've replaced it with a new streamlined funding structure that's focused on the equitable and efficient delivery of uh, needed infrastructure improvements um, with a new component for equitable input. Uh, next slide. Uh, we've also looked at other things that affect housing, um, climate and infrastructure decisions. We updated our parks master plan for the first time in 50 years, um, where we're focused on um, delivering parks that meet the needs of our growing city while addressing the stark disparities in our park system. Um, again, with that clear commitment that the city council adopted to prioritize investments in the areas of the city where they're needed most. This meant looking at our park standards um, that were really outdated. They were looking at a suburban model sprawl type of development um, and really looking at new ways to have a park standard that encourages the more productive use of land in our urban core, which is where we're trying to develop. Uh, next slide. Um, and then we also um, had um, our climate resiliency plan uh, adopted and in place now, focusing on how we prepare for a changing climate while also taking the opportunity to improve our communities as we do that. Next slide. Um, and then I will end on this. Um, also, um, I have a new division um, that is just focused on equitable public engagement. So we are focused on engaging residents in new ways, meeting real people where they are, speaking in languages and words that people actually understand, um, targeting engagement uh, with community-based organizations, um, getting out into the communities. I go into the communities multiple times a week. We have like beers everywhere with everybody all the time. Um, it's pretty crazy. My kids like have gone to like so many different places and they are probably hating my job. Um, and, um, you know, really making sure um, that people are no longer excluded from the planning conversation. It's an ongoing process. We are not getting it perfect um, every step of the way, but every step of the way that we take forward, we try to do better with the ultimate desired outcome of having our planning decisions influenced by people that are representative of the demographics of our diverse population, not just those with the privilege and resources to participate. Um, so with that, I am really excited to be here. Thank you so much uh, to Amir for uh, having me here. Um, and I also just hope that we all leave this um, embracing that change is good. And although we are at the end of our session, but I don't want to finish the symposium without asking some question from Heidi. So um, if it's okay, we extend a little bit more the time of the symposium to get some questions. Anyone? Very short one, and um, I would like to understand how you regulate the Airbnb market in San Diego, as this is also something which sometimes has a problem with housing, right? Uh, yes, um, we had a lot of short-term rentals that were unregulated. Um, getting a short-term rental ordinance in place was very difficult. It is not something that the planning department brought forward. One of our co uh, council members that represents one of our coastal areas that had the highest concentration of short-term rentals brought that forward. Um, that was a very, very, very uh, careful process to bring it forward. It took years. Um, it is in place right now. Um, then we had another step. We had to take it to Coastal Commission um, to have it apply within the coastal areas, which is actually where most of our um, housing is. Of course, there's tension there because um, of the Coastal Commission's focus on low-cost visitor accommodations, even though I don't really consider $600 a night to be low-cost, but whatever. 
Um, they really also, you know, wanted to focus on making sure that there was access to the coast. Um, so that was, you know, an additional like 18 month delay. Um, it does go into effect um, in the next several weeks. Um, and um, in order for it to actually be effective, it needs to be enforced. And we're a big city with limited resources. Um, so we do have another department that's thankfully not mine um, that is tasked with um, enforcing it. Hi, Heidi. I had a quick question for you over here. I was wondering for some of the new planners, if you could describe your career path uh, leading up to becoming the director of the large city. And then the second question would be, when are you coming to San Jose to be our director? <laughs> um, well, I started here. <laughs> Um, it did all start here, um, and I worked for a private consulting firm, ESA, who sponsored this event, so thanks, um, thanks to you guys. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I worked there uh, before and during law school um, for about six years as an environmental consultant, um, and I went to law school, and then I also got a job at a large firm, and I represented developers. Um, got great experience, um, worked for really great projects. Um, and um, then, you know, the economy crashed in like 2008, you know? So, um, so that doesn't, didn't work out, but um, the partner that I worked for um, knew the newly elected city attorney at the time. Um, and so I was solid. Um, I served um, as a deputy city attorney for nearly 10 years. Um, I worked with the planning department as my client um, that whole time, but I also had the opportunity to litigate cases, um, also take them on appeal. Um, and when I kind of got fed up with it, I kind of just went to the planning department and said, could you guys just hire me now? <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. not to lose their, I, I guess, positive outlook and optimism and just even, you know, the want to come to work and have to deal with all this day in and out because I know that can get exhausting. So what is it do you, that you do to, con, you know, continue to motivate them and let them see there is a light at the end of the tunnel and, you know, even the small wins are big? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a good question. I am, we have struggled just like most jurisdictions and especially uh, my colleagues at the other big cities with high vacancy rates, really unprecedented um, high vacancy rates. We are hiring, just leaving that out there. <laughs> um, but you know, really what it is, um, what, what, what I tell people, what I, my managers on my team um, tell our staff is um, we do cool stuff. We really do. And if you work for, I hate to like knock on the county of San Diego because you guys are with the counties, but we just do cooler stuff than the county does. <laughs> and so even though the county pays a little bit more, um, we do cooler stuff. Um, and so, yeah, we may get more opposition, you know, but, um, you know, I, I hold very regular department meetings so that everybody knows, you know, what's going on all the time and why we are doing it. Um, we have an online work program that I encourage you all to check out because we're really proud of it. Um, literally every single thing that my department does is on our work program, um, but um, kind of to the why and how we stay motivated is we work for a mayor um, that's very generally popular among city workers, and he has a strategic plan with five priorities. And the planning department implements all five of those priorities, homelessness, climate, infrastructure, mobility, and equity. Um, so we, our skin is in the game on, on everything. Um, and so what we have on our work program is all five strategic plan areas and how each initiative that we work on achieves that. So there's buy-in from our staff um, on what we're doing um, to kind of get through it. There's also a lot of camaraderie, you know, in kind of like reveling in the craziness. Um, that helps too. And then also um, maybe not popular, but I do make them come into the office now. So um, they do have that camaraderie with each other to kind of, it was a little bit more isolating when, when everybody was, was not seeing each other for a long time. Thank you, Heidi. It's really hard to end this session. I wish we could continue it for another hour, but thank you all for coming. Thank you, Heidi, for the sharing the insight. And hopefully we see most of you at six o'clock, hotel slow rooftop. Thank you.